Welcome back to the Rodcast. Yes, I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis. We got a great show planned for you. We do have a final four. The final four is set. Uh, we also will get into the uh, disappointing loss for the Texas women uh, in the tournament. They are now out. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit too. Also, uh, the NBA teams, the hottest team in the NBA uh, is in the great state of Texas. We'll discuss that coming up a little bit later on. Uh, there may be another record breaking game in women's basketball tonight. Uh, it is April Fool's, so it may be uh, a lot of uh, fools out there uh, watching uh, basketball tonight who did not have the uh, final four that is set right now with Connecticut versus Alabama, Purdue versus North Carolina State. Uh, my bracket's been busted, but we'll talk about the final four uh, that is set in men's basketball. Also, the Elite Eight game, which might end up being the highest rated game of the NCAA tournament period, men or women's. Uh, tonight when you have uh, LSU facing off against Iowa. So we'll talk about that. We'll get into it. A lot of hoops on the show today. We will get into the NFL uh, coming up in the 7 o'clock hour. We'll talk about the NFL, why the uh, Texans are all the buzz among the players. There are players willing to give the Texans a hometown discount. As a matter of fact, I'm one already did. We'll also talk about the Texans. Uh, they were the top of uh, uh, free agent location for one of the uh, top yeah, agents top. out there. It didn't work out, uh, but I think it says a lot about uh, the perception changes about the Texans. We'll get into that. Raj rant of the day. We'll talk about the Cowboys. They need a running back. We'll talk about where you can find those running backs in the NFL draft. Also, we'll get into uh, behind the burnt orange curtain, talk some Texas football, spring practice. So we'll get into spring practice, news, notes, and nuggets. So we're jam-packed. Rangers report as well on the show coming up a little bit later on uh, because the Rangers started their season off with a bang not the case for the Astros uh we'll talk about that yeah yeah I know my man Patrick he's an Astros fan too I'm not sure what's going on there but we'll discuss it coming up so we're jam-packed a lot on the show please participate give us all your thoughts your questions suggestions whatever it may be on the text line 512-447-3776 before we do any of that let's introduce you to the real MVP one of the hardest working members of the ARN family he's got a hustler spirit period I don't know what he's paid but I'm pretty damn sure these underpaid Ain't no 401k for this hustler, and he's a hustle man of many talents. He's my friend, neighbor, and co-host. It's Patrick Davis, y'all. What's going on, Patrick? Oh, man, it's good to be back on a Monday. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, interesting. Uh, this is uh, – we've got the Rangers broadcast going on now in the studios, which means that uh, oh, no. there's more people using the studio now because um, we're getting in here that's for the true. most part. So I came in and things are moved around and the chair was set differently. I'm like, I don't like this one bit. Not one bit, Rod. Who's been in my space? Who's been in my space? <laughs> my chair. Come in and mess up my chair. <laughs> Even on Monday, just surprise. Oh, yeah, that's, 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 that's not, not a good Monday surprise. You don't like that. Like, where's all my stuff? For the last hour, just trying to mess with you. I'm like, where, where did I have it? I didn't know where I had it, but I was right. It was the way I liked it. Now every time oh, I get down, like, something's wrong. Something's Did they move there. the dials too? They changed like the levels yeah, and stuff. Lean you know? back. It was because oh. they're lounging. Because they're running the Rangers game. They're not having to lean forward and talking to a microphone <laughs> in the cage. They're just running the board. So they have a different oh. setup than I have. Yeah, man. It's, I didn't I mean, realize that. I didn't realize that. It's good point. No, so it's a thing. So I'm like, oh man, I didn't realize this because I've been spoiled. Because normally we share with other people, and you, you know, but lately coming, nobody's been in there but really you because you and maybe Ty every now and then. Yeah. Too, Ty's not, he's not in this seat as much as I am. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Somebody was in like the driver's seat. Somebody was in like right. mission control. In the <laughs> you, know, you gotta get it. El Capitan. <laughs> Let me introduce my co host. Uh, he's a proud alumni of DBU. He's got more papers than Dunder Mifflin and watches more film than Siskel and Ebert. He is the new. Rod, father of Austin Sports Radio, Mr. Rod Babers. I appreciate that intro, as always, brother. I really do. Uh, we got your horn headlines as well. My man, Patrick Davis, like I said, he's a hustle man of many talents. He does a lot on the show. So we'll also have your horn headlines. Uh, he also have the big fat poll of the day that's coming up at 645. That's always fun. Always a good topic of conversation. Uh, that's also when we'll learn about the musically themed day of the week. That always puts everybody in a much better mood. So we got all that coming up on the show. Yeah, the show randomly has a lot of uh, catching up from the weekend to do. Uh, so we'll get into the the, uh, the final four. Uh, we'll also talk about the women. Uh, we'll hear some audio actually from the Texas women. I'm losing uh, a very weird story too over the weekend. How the I'm sure you heard about it too, Patrick. Well, the the women's 
one of the 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 the, the set locations for the women's elite eight it had different like basically uh different three-point lines like the three yeah, point lines were not even they were not congruent yeah they, they go put them out there because i've seen them doing it before uh, where you go out there and you basically tape a three-point line down before a game yeah, uh, and they'll do it, and I guess whoever did it screwed it up. Did it wrong? Oh man! And it, the thing up is, that? it's a weird thing because you wouldn't notice it by eyesight normally, but when players start playing on it, they if, notice it. If you take five threes and everyone's short, or if you take five threes and everyone's long, you're like, is that me? Am or, I just that off? Is everybody off? off? Or am I missing <laughs> all in the exact same way? Something feels a little off. It looks a little off. And especially at this point in the season where they've been playing on it all year long, you can sometimes kind of notice that change. It was a weird thing. I don't know how much impact it necessarily had on the well, entire yeah, season game. Even when you and go yeah, yeah. And, and Texas yeah, shot yeah. six threes in the game anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's not like they shot a ton and missed a yeah, bunch. Yeah. I mean, they didn't they hit one, but as in way, they just didn't shoot a lot. They haven't been a huge three point shooting team all season long. They try and get it inside. So I don't know how much it fully affected them. But, yeah, it is one of those – it's a thing that when women's <clears throat> college basketball is, you know, probably at the highest point it's ever been. Come on. Things like this. Tournament. Say it's unacceptable at a point where women's basketball is getting to to still have little screw-ups like this. It, it, it's, it's, it's frustrating to still see happening. But uh, I, I guarantee you – I'll tell you this. I guarantee you for the game tonight, though they have oh, triple – Oh, <laughs> no, Every no. dimension of the court. For that Iowa LSU game, you're right about that. That's there's no doubt about it. But yeah, for those who didn't hear, uh, Sunday women's elite eight tournament game was in Portland. Um, and basically they yeah, they didn't measure the both sides correctly. Um, they found that at the center three the three point lines appeared to be different against the double A to measure them. They they don't even report who asked them to measure them and who knew it was off because there were teams that played prior to Texas and NC State. This, that's just when they knew about it. Yeah. For the Texas yes. State game. Um, and there's, and there's video you can see both coaches walking out to the line and then doing the foot after foot thing on both yeah, ends of the yeah. court to see if it's a slightly off. They, yeah, there's video of both of the coaches doing that. So at some point, somebody mentioned something. And yeah, it was both- five games. Yeah. So five games had been played uh, on the Moda Center floor before the the tournament before sunday uh, and sorry during the tournament before sunday so uh, one of those teams i'm sure was like hey man something's off or maybe multiple teams said something was off uh vic schaefer said he uh was told about it during warm-ups and then said he did i believe he said he didn't let the ladies know prior to the game um he said did not tell his team about the three-point lines um and said it's a shame Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can see how you're not telling your teams because that's just another psychological, you know, kind of block of some kind or distraction. Yeah. You don't want to do that because it is even. He said if it went to overtime, then he might have had yeah, something to say about it because I guess that's when you, you some, some yeah. one team might get. Well, yeah, because yeah, yeah, then it's more than one. Every team every, gets a period. Yeah. I get that. Uh, that kind uh, of thing. Uh, two uh, periods. So uh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's so it's not that big deal, but it, it, no, it's more of a <laughs> an indictment on the NCAA. And the lack of, I don't know, the, the, really the lack of competence at times with the NCAA with the simplest of tasks, which is, hey, man, just make sure the courts are measured correctly. That should be protocol before every game. I mean, like you said, you've seen them doing that, and somehow they screwed it up in the NCAA game. But didn't make a big of a difference, that big of a difference. Uh, Vic Schaefer said he was disappointed. Anyway, weird story. But uh, there are a lot of uh, other great stories in sports that we got to get to. Um, before we do that, we'll do the horn headlines from my man Patrick Davis. He'll get us caught up, educated, informed on all the top stories of the day. Uh, then we'll talk about the uh, the men's uh, Final Four. Uh, also talk about the Texas women uh, losing. Not the reason they lost was not because of the three point uh, uh, the three point con- controversy uh there with the ncaa but uh more because uh the ladies had uh really just a slow start in that game nc state was hot um so we'll get into that coming up also we'll talk about the nba my man patrick is one of the biggest nba fans i know watches a lot of it and i'm sure right now he can talk about the hottest team in the nba because they're right here in the state of texas all of that before we do that though let's get to the horn headlines all right your horn headlines brought to you by top gun rentals and lawn equipment Texas women's basketball season ended on Sunday with a loss to NC State, 76-66. to Madison Booker led the way for the Longhorns with 17 points. But a lack of shooting and a hot Wolfpack team put a stop to the Horn season in the Elite Eight. South Carolina also punched a ticket to the Final Four with two more teams advancing from games that will be played tonight. 
in the men's tournament. The final four is set with UConn, Alabama, Purdue, NC, and NC State all winning over the weekend to advance. NC State will take on Purdue in a matchup including a battle between big men Zach Eady and DJ Burns. And defending champions UConn will take on the red-hot shooting Alabama. Both games will happen on Saturday evening. Texas baseball won their series with Kansas State two games to one, including a 21 to 11 win on Friday night. Jalen Flores had seven RBIs over the weekend, and Max Grubbs put on a solid performance on Saturday, pitching six innings with five strikeouts and only allowing one run. Texas is back in action on Tuesday, facing Abilene Christian. Texas softball struggled in a weekend series against Oklahoma State, dropping the series two to one. Texas was able to pick up a hard-fought win on Friday with Sith Lily Gutierrez only allowing one run in the outing. They will now get ready to take on the number one team in the country, Oklahoma, in Austin this upcoming weekend. MLB opening weekend came to a close with the Astros still winless, losing all four games in their opening series to the Yankees. They will try to rebound against the Blue Jays uh, coming up next. And the Rangers pick up a series win against the Cubs. Rookie phenom Wyatt Langford had hits in all three games, and Adolis Garcia had two home runs and four RBIs to kick off his season. The Rangers start a three-game series with the Tampa Bay Rays this afternoon with pregame beginning at 515 right here on the Horn. And in the NBA, the Mavericks ended the Rockets' win streak on Sunday to take over the five seed in the Western Conference, where the Spurs lost to the Warriors, moved the Rockets to two games back from Golden State for the last spot in the plan with eight games left in the season to go. And that is your Horn Headlines. All right, thank you, Patrick, for the Horn Headlines. And, yes, your uh, men's Final Four is set. And I got to tell you, uh, if you look at the most recent Final Four appearance, obviously UConn was just here last season. Uh, but for NC State, 1983. For Purdue, 1980. Uh, for Alabama, it's their first time ever. So a lot of like generations of, of college basketball fans have never really seen uh, you know, this combination of these teams represented in the final four. I think that's pretty cool. Um, um, NC State is your Cinderella. We got the Cinderella story. You would, we wanted to see a Cinderella make it, and they are the true Cinderella story. And, man, they just – talk about a team that got hot at the right time, got hot in the ACC tournament, and then they're they're still hot right now. And, and I think that's kind of what has led NC State here. I saw this little factoid. Um, how about this? Um, NC State obviously beating Duke – in the tournament and beating them in the ACC tournament. First time a team beat uh, an opponent um, in conference tournament, NCAA tournament in the same season since 2016. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that, that, that says a lot about how hot NC State is to, to beat a team, a program like Duke twice. It's hard to beat any team twice in the season, but to beat that program in college basketball twice says about a lot about how hot that team is. Yeah, and it's crazy. The post-game interview with DJ Burns yesterday – was interesting because he comes off and they're like, what is it? And he goes, oh, we just all started trying. Basically, it was his enough. <laughs> no one's showing up late to practice anymore. And, you know, we're all just connected <laughs> on the court. And you're like, wait, you're still showing up late to practice? <laughs> <laughs> he was honest. He was honest. But DJ Burns has been a great story just because the big man going inside and, and you know, and, every, and I think everybody loves a guy who's just this big guy who's smiling the whole game. It doesn't look like he is a professional. It could be a professional athlete, even though he's got size. He looks like he'd be an old lineman. Yeah, like <laughs> he looks like he's going to be a big star basketball player run up and down the court. But yeah, NC State has been a lot of fun. We didn't get the full chalk final four that a lot of people thought. No, that no. It be more chalk. I mean, I UConn too. right now looks insanely good. Uh, UConn looks really, I mean, they're, they're not even having a trouble getting through games. And then Purdue, you know, you're starting to get to the point of the season where people are starting to watch Purdue and realize that that's Zach Eady goes to the free throw line a lot. It is a, it's yeah. a thing that people he do scores. not remember because they, they just see the final score. They don't look at the free throw stats. And Zach Eady, go, he's 7'4". There's, people can't guard him in college basketball. So, you know, Foul they, they bump him and bump him, and refs are going to call it that way. So uh, it'll be – that'll be an interesting matchup. That DJ Burns-Zach Eady matchup. How they call that between two really yeah. big guys? If they put a, you know, if they put DJ Burns in foul trouble, that'll disappoint a lot of people. Just let they and let they, him play. They, just let him they, just they, bang they, it out up on this side. Because they say <laughs> this is what people want to watch. Yeah, they yeah, want to watch these two guys on the court and going at it. Uh, it would it would be a sad end if they basically just go. Well, Zach Eady shot thirty five free throws in the game, and so they're yeah. in the tournament. They're in the finals, and that Cinderella ends 
because of foul trouble. That would be disappointing. Mm-hmm. Now, if he fouls him, it's it fouls him. You know, it's you got. Yeah, be man, they're just playing like physical. physical. Yeah, you I'm with you on that. That's a, That's great, a great point, point though. though. That, I, I agree with that. that. NCAA and they need to be really, really careful about how they call that game. If it's a foul, yeah, it's a foul. But they're just playing physical. And they're going back and forth, man. Let the, let, hey, man, we haven't seen that before. I mean, we, we haven't seen it before. We haven't seen it in a while, I should say. Yeah, uh, legit, legitimate big men because you just don't see legitimate big men like that. And Zachy, he's been, he's been dominant. He really has been. Um, how about this? If you look at players with 100 plus points and 60 plus rebounds prior to even getting to the final four, uh, Zach Eady, uh, Blake Griffin, Elvin Hayes, and did in 1968. Um, seventh player with 40 plus points and 15 rebounds uh, in the tournament. And I believe he's the first player to do it since 1990 to do that, uh, which I believe he, uh, I believe it was Bo Kimball who did it in 1990. Uh, So he's, man, he's, he's a force. There's no doubt. It is because he's, he's kind of the force that um, Purdue has that really no teams have an answer for. So you got no answer for him. I mean, what are you going to do? Like you said, they just foul him kind of the hack a shack thing and he's a he's a decent foul sh- foul he's a free throw shooter which is you know i mean for a big man it, it's, it's big more, more really common now because they know the game has changed i think back in the day you didn't see it as much because guys just they didn't call as many fouls inside so you weren't necessarily spending a ton of time training on the free throw line because you weren't expecting to get there a ton in today's game you do expect to get to the free throw line and so if you're if you're a big man, they're gonna tell you get learn how to shoot these because the difference of you being in in clutch time and being out is hitting these. Yeah. So if you can't hit them, then we have to pull you out of the game when the game when it's on the line because all they're gonna do is foul you and stop it and get the ball back to them. Like it's yeah. the easiest defensive stop. Don't be a liability uh, yeah. in that regard. Um, all right, let's. Uh, yeah, it's a good. It's a good point though about Zach Eady and the free throw shot. I hope they don't do that. That'd make that a boring game. <laughs> it would. I mean, they've done it a lot. I just could see because of the story we have with DJ Burns, the story that NC State is. I could see them, and it's really just you kind of assign the right officiating crew. You mention to them, "Hey, let's let this game be played out a little bit more." And if they foul, they foul. If arms go down, arms go down. It's a foul. Uh, but if they're straight up and down and there's contact, let them play. Yeah. No, I like that. Uh, no doubt. So hoping that those are entertaining games. So you got your Cinderella story for all of those who are big fans of Cinderella. Uh, and also, I think it's interesting when you start looking at, I mean, you said UConn, Alabama, UConn's just been so dominant. They haven't had a uh, down performance, really. Have they? No. Yeah. <laughs> and it, so there's just no drama, really, with UConn right now. Hopefully, Bama can infuse some. I think everybody believes UConn's going to win, um, but I don't want them to steamroll Bama. I'd like that to be a, co- a competitive matchup at least. Um, no, no, so, well, this is the good thing for Alabama. So the question is, can Alabama continue shooting the way they're shooting? I mean, they beat UNC by hitting a bunch of shots late. They also played a style. They also play a weird style of basketball defensively, where they're going to let your guys play. They were playing off of UNC. They basically let a couple guys stay off. They had to pull them out of the game. Uh, because they were just letting them shoot threes. It hurt them early. U, uh, UNC couldn't keep up the pace of guys there, 15, 20% three-point shooters, getting wide open threes and missing them. Yeah. Uh, and so they could play help defense on the big guys inside. That's kind of what you're going to have to hope happens for UConn, that you're able to slow them down enough uh, with letting, you know, trying to focus in on their higher scores because defensively UConn's a really good team. Offensively, they're pr- they're pretty good offensively too. They're one of the best offense teams, but they're not elite offensively. They're not one of those teams that's going to win just on offense. Alabama is. Alabama is yeah, an elite yeah. offensive team. So if they are able to score at a high point, this is the type of the time of season where those teams can win. And it's something that I was watching over the weekend uh, in college, where you just watched again why Big Twelve and then the SEC to certain points have issues in the tournament a lot of times. And I was watching, and I was just thinking of games I've watched from other leagues in the Big East and the Big Ten and the ACC especially. The Juicy, the ACC officiates games like the tournament all season long. So ACC teams, when they get to the tournament, are really ready to play in the style of basketball the NCAA uses in the tournament. Letting it be a little bit more free-flowing, not calling more fouls, not allowing the inside and the physical teams. And the Big 12 plays a much more physical, hard style. So the game, in when you're in the Big 12, it is just a gauntlet those teams are all really good and they all play against each other but they play a really physical more slowed down style in the big 12 a lot except for teams like kansas and in baylor who both won national championships 
that those guys try and speed the ball up a little bit more because they understand when you get to the tournament, the style of play is going to be sped up. The style of play is going to be offensive more than defensive. So you're going to have to play defense, but you kind of have to play offense first. And the Big 12 and then the SEC, to an extent, some of the teams there really build around this. We're going to be a defensive first team, and we'll figure out offense. Yeah. And if you build that way, when you get to the tournament, it's really, really hard to win. You have to be a you know a yeah, pro- yeah. proficient on all the teams. Yeah. Now, if LJ She doesn't get hurt for Houston, they maybe have a better shot in that game. I don't want to you know injuries suck, uh, so you don't want to say that they they couldn't have made a run. But that Houston style, it's somewhat hampering when you get to the NCAA tournament. That your style is all about a a perception of how the game is called for you in a, your conference that is no longer there when you get to the NCAA tournament. And when you say, well, we can play this hard next, this hard, rough style that we play, and then you get the tournament, they go, we can't do it here. We're going to call every bump. We're going to call everything in there because we want scoring. We want it to go. And we want to, you know, and if you're going to keep fouling, we'll just keep calling it. But we assume that at a certain point, you'll stop. You'll adjust. You'll adjust. And then the scoring will go up. The game will go faster. And that's what we want to see. So it's just an interesting thing that I think that a lot of conferences should start to look at more Mm -hmm. of trying to officiate and trying to streamline the game more like the NCAA tournament does, because if that's your final goal, ultimate goal, yeah, of course, if that's the ultimate goal, then it doesn't do you much good to play one style of basketball all season long and then flip the script in, in March and hope your team can figure it out in two weekends. Yeah. yeah. Because no. I think that hurt Iowa state, especially that's one of those reasons why you don't necessarily think they're a, a national championship team, even though they had a really good season and won the Big 12 tournament. That's why you worry about a team like Houston, because even though LJ Sheed can go off, he's not consistent enough. Uh, LJ Cryer, and I keep saying, uh, and then, yeah, he's not consistent enough. I keep saying LJ Sheed, Jamal Sheed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but if you have those guys, then you can, you know, you just have to have consistent scoring. And defense is great, but in the NCAA now, NCAA, the uh, defense doesn't necessarily always win championships. You have to have a really good offense as well. Yeah. yeah, no, uh, I mean, same thing in football, right? Defense wins championships. Like, well, uh, it does, but you gotta, you gotta have it. But I think I take you gotta have the quarterback and the offense. No, I, I'm with you on that. I think ultimately, I mean, that's kind of Rick Barnes's issue, right? His identity yeah. of his brand of basketball is kind of what you're talking about, too. Um, that in the tournament, that's something that blows up uh, in your face at times. No, that's a great point. I love that theory. Uh, okay, uh, real quick. Uh, can we jump to some, some NBA hoops just really quickly? And we'll talk about, obviously, we'll get back to the, the tournament conversation. But the two hottest teams in the West, actually two hottest teams in the NBA met over the weekend, uh, the Houston Rockets and the Mavs. And the Mavs just put it on the Rockets. Uh, they beat them 125 to 107, ended their, well, I believe it was an 11-game win streak at the time. Now the Mavs are on seven-game win streak. I believe it's the longest in the NBA, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they're rolling. And Luca once again put himself in the MVP conversation. He had 47, 12, and 7. Uh, Kyrie looked really good, too, for him. I mean, they they pretty much, uh, like I said, they put an Old Testament-style butt whipping on the Rockets. But I do want to talk about the Mavs. I mean, the Mavs are now 11-1 and one in their previous, in their last 12 games. Uh, the only game they lost where Luca was out. Um, their offensive rating and defensive rating in that in that time span during that streak is in the last in the last 12 games basically top four in both uh net rating their second they're they're like right said they're trending right now I, I, I my preseason prediction for Luca to win MVP still don't know if that's gonna happen um I think he's close I think he's Second right now behind Nikola Jokic, but, I mean, Nikola Jokic is uh, not only playing at a high level, but his team is winning at a real high level. But the Mavs are winning now. They're getting hot. They're hot. They're getting a lot of attention. Patrick, do you see my prediction for Luka for MVP now gaining a little bit more momentum? Is it now something you see that's a possibility? It, it is a possibility for sure, because especially, you know, if they realistic, get a realistic one, not just a it, it's realistic. I think there's a couple reasons. One, I don't think they want to give it to Jokic again. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. Fatigue. There's, a, there's yeah, there's a piece of it where, you know, writers and everybody else don't necessarily want to give certain guys, you know, it's just, you don't want to give anybody that three, you know, three it's just, row, it's not three in a row because Embiid went last year. So it would be three, which is still ridiculous. And, and I think that's, 
entering into this category where it's the same thing that baseball writers not putting people in the Hall of Fame and football writers, you know, questioning certain guys. It's it, it, there's certain things that these voters will push back on and giving a third one, they'll sometimes push back on. So it, it could be if they're looking for somebody else, that's where they could go. We know that there's the rules now about having to play a certain amount of games. So it knocks off other competitors. I know people want to put Jason Tatum in that group, but they're not playing necessarily great down the stretch. So that'll be an earlier season thing. Plus that team has a lot more players on it uh, than, than the Mavs do. Uh, they're just a lot more loaded than the Mavs are as a team. Uh, so I think that he's definitely in that conversation. It, it's you just never kind of know how the voting is going to go now. That is it. You have to be a top three team in your conference. You have to be a top two team. Do they, do they put it into, you know, the MVP is a, you know, if you're not, if you're not above a certain threshold of wins, are you not eligible for it? Because if you are, Luke is definitely going to be in that uh, because of the fact that they've, they treaded water. They were able to tread water through the roughest parts of their season, through some injuries, through some other issues, and now getting through to the back end of it. Now they're in the easier part of their schedule where they're supposed to be playing at the level they are, and they are. They're now stepping up, and they have the longest win streak in the NBA and a point where other teams are starting to falter a little bit more and teams are starting to struggle as you get down to it. Again, we said there's eight games left in the season for a lot of these teams. You're at a point where if they can hold it together for eight more games, he puts up a couple more big performances. He's definitely on that very, very short list of two or three guys that are going to be getting the votes. And then it just kind of comes down to, do you give it to Jokic because he's because he's on the, the number one team in the West? Or do you look down the rankings a little bit more? Do you give it to Tatum because he's on you know the one of the top teams in the East? Or do you look down to Luka? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I just I think, think uh, man, yeah, Luca's got a he's got an inch stronger. If they end they with the longest win streak in the NBA. They got a chance. They end the season, and I'm not yeah. saying they're going to continue to win out. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah, how many that'll be what a uh, 15 game win streak, I believe. Yeah, yeah. He does that. That's I think he went. Honestly, they do that a lot more. I'm not going to say he's going to do that. I guess we can go through the schedule and see if it's possible. I don't know if I want them to do that going into the playoffs. I don't know if they wear the Mavs out. I do want to see the Mavs make a bit of a run. I know a lot of people are on that bandwagon. Tim Lever has been really excited about him. He plays the sound of a Brian Grinhorst saying a lot of people around the league are saying the Mavs are trending at the right time. Uh, so for Mavs fans, I, you know, I know they're really excited, but I do think that was good. But even if winning – no, no. Say, you know, winning, uh, if they got eight games left, say yeah. winning six, six or seven of the next eight, I think that would help them too. But, but yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. It's, it's going to be split. Uh, it's going to be a, a heavy split between those three guys that you mentioned. Well, and, and I haven't talked about Shea Gilligan's Alexander. He's that's, in there too. Your, that's your, he's, that's your he's, other he's name. Wild card that's in there. So I, you're right. I think he's got as good a chance as anybody, but there's no guarantee. There's no, fr there's no front runner right now. That's the weird thing. Usually I mean, the, front if right betting on front runner is Jokic just because it's Jokic. He's because always, he yeah, he's, does yeah. and he's the guy. Uh, it, yeah. SBA is like that. It just feels like among like NBA analysts and stuff, there's not a lot of a, a favorite clear cut. Yeah. I, I don't because I don't because again, I don't think people want to vote for Jokic. I think that's kind of your there is the fatigue of it. I don't think they necessarily want to give it to him again. But then SGA, it's okay. How much of this is SGA? How much of this is Oklahoma City? Is this a team that people really believe is going to make a run in the postseason? I know that shouldn't matter in, in regular season MVP voting, but it does. It does not. Uh, if you will def don't necessarily, yeah. for whatever reason, still believe that this Oklahoma City team is for real, even though they've played all season long, even though they have the best record in the West right now, that somehow they're still going to be looked at as a team that maybe is overachieving and and they won't get it. I'm not saying that's right. Just saying yeah. that's kind of a narrative that's out there about them. Uh, so, but they they, you know, I I think he would probably be on my list. He's. And I know voting odds wise, he's lower than Luca right now. It's it's Jokic, Luca, SGA, then Tatum, uh, in in odds. I I maybe put SGA above Luca just because I think wow. team you still vote, but it's just because they go by record. And if you say they're the number one team in the West, we're giving this to the number one team in the West. If they hold on to that one seed going into the playoffs, I think that may push it over the edge. Uh, but at the same point. It's hard not to give it to Luka. If you don't want to yeah. give it to Jokic, that's where the question, you know, if, you, if you're if you saying I'm not voting Jokic, 
I'm not giving him my first place vote because I don't want him to win it three times in four years. Where do you vote? Do you go with Luca? There's going to be people that don't like Luca as much because of the way he plays basketball that, you know, maybe they don't like him as much on the defensive end. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I, it's just you know it's gonna be it's gonna yeah, be one at the end of the season, and then we'll probably both watch as Jokic wins his fourth or his third. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. You, you, you're right about that. Uh, like you said, it's third in four, four years. years. Okay, so the the Mavs remaining schedule: they're at Golden State, then they got Atlanta, then they play Golden State again at home. They play Atlanta at home too. Uh, they play the Rockets again at home. Then they're at Charlotte, at Miami, um, then playing Detroit at home, and then at OKC actually. Yeah, in the season. Yeah, I mean that's not a that's not an easy schedule to end the season. I mean, it's, uh, it's especially with at Miami, at Miami, and at OKC. And because OKC probably, I mean, you know, do they play? Do they care about games at the end of the season? Last game of the season. I mean, if they're the NBA, that one seed. Well, that would mean that would mean that the Mavs literally have they they, they continued their win streak if they're gonna contend for the one seed. No, no, they're I'm saying OKC. Okay, oh, oh, with with, with Denver. OKC okay, is a half game lead on Denver right now. Yeah. Yeah. So OKC could really care about that game at the end of the season. It all depends on if your seed's locked in or not. If your seed's locked in, you don't care. Yeah, but yeah. if you're trying to, if you have, if you're caring about your, what your seed is going to well, be. Well, the Mavs definitely, definitely care about it because they will be trying to trying get into the but That's the thing. The is they're locked in at the five. Seasons. They're two games back from the Clippers uh, for the four seed right now. They're six games back from the three. They're not getting into that that three seed. Uh, but it depends. If the Pelicans fall down. Uh, if there's not a game, if there's if they have two games between them and the above and below with one game to go, they're probably resting everybody. Yeah. Uh, yeah so right. it, it'll be that'll be the one. And, and as far as Miami is, I know this is a you know it's Miami. It's end of the season. Jimmy Butler likes to go off, but they're a, you know they're a, not a great. They're fifty five percent win team right now. They're not a great team this season. They they lost more players in free agency. They haven't fully reloaded. Once they get to the playoffs, you know they can be dangerous. But I, they have not been playing great basketball in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. We'll, see, we'll see if uh, the Mavs, Mavs can uh, continue like, their winning ways right now. They're arguably the hottest team in the NBA. Uh, all right, good stuff there from my man, Patrick. Let's talk about uh, some Texas football. When we come back, we'll go behind the burnt orange curtain, get into some practice, uh, spring practice, news, notes, and nuggets. Uh, and also a couple of ESPN articles showing some love to some Longhorns. Uh, we'll review that as well. All of that and more. When we return, this is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming right back on the horn. Good stuff. I mean, I swear our phone's listening to us. They got to pick your MVP, literally NBA Central, just like right across, like sitting on my timeline <laughs> with everybody you mentioned, and then they added Giannis to the mix. It's crazy. All right, let's see.
All right, welcome into some uh, Texas football conversation. Of course, the Longhorns are uh, right now in uh, spring practice, uh, engaging in spring practice. Uh, I was over uh, at Owen Texas Football. I go to OwenTexasFootball.com. You can go to Owen Texas Football, the YouTube channel, um, and just uh, listen to my man Bobby Burden and Jerry Hamilton talk about some of their practice updates. And apparently, because now they've, they're four padded practices in. So they've, they've had the, uh, the pads on for four practices. I believe they had six practices total. The seventh practice, I believe, is tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken. Um, um, so they they got a pretty good little sample size now of the guys uh, in pads getting physical. And the report was that the last practice was their most physical padded practice. And you, you're trying to build to a crescendo, right? You're trying to, uh, you know, make sure that you peak at the right time during the spring or right around the spring game. You want to play your best football, at least practicing your best football because they're not playing yet. Uh, but the reports uh, that uh, my man Jerry Hamilton threw out there was that Sex Cedric Baxter looks really good like he is uh in the since now they're actually you know pa- they're actually in pads and they're actually now getting physical hitting one another he's one of the guys now you're separating because the first part of practice uh, is you know they're in what start calls underwear so i mean everybody looks pretty good it's just guys running around great athletes showing off their uh agility showing off how fast they are uh, once you put the pads on all the pads on some guys slow down. Some guys stay the same speed as they were basically when they were running in what start calls underwear, what we call shells. Um, and then once you start hitting, that's a whole nother element of football that also separates and elevates guys. And so trust me, the coach are looking at the guys who are now separating, elevating, the more they hit, uh, the more other guys start to stand out because some guys in the midst of that physicality, they can combine that with the, the finesse of the game. All right, because that's what you have early on is the finesse. Yeah. And everybody looks good in the finesse. Everybody's out there in shorts and shorts. Oh, oh. And just, you know what I mean? Look, looking good, looking swift. Nobody's hitting anybody. It's like, man, everybody out here looks really, really good. They start hitting guys. And then, hey, man, some guys run a little bit slower. All right. They, <laughs> right. They're a little bit more timid out there. And then once you add, you know, the, all the pads and then you add full on physicality. That's when you get guys that separate and elevate. So, and some guys just aren't ready for that yet. Some of the younger guys, and maybe even some of the guys who've been in the program a while. But that's what you—that's what you're looking at now as a coach. Once you got those padded practices in, who's separating now and elevating now that we are bringing the physicality element to it, and who still has that, um, you know, elite level uh, agility, uh, elite level speed, even though now we got the pads and we're playing at a more physical level. So. Um, good to see Cedric Baxter, one of them guys. That's basically throwing out there. Yeah, no, He's it's it's good to see him because we know that he was somebody last year that we, you know, there was issues of him staying on the field at points. Great point. And, and we expected him to put on, you know, get some work done in the the weight room over the off season and and come back in a better shape and be more ready for it. But he was a guy that you saw, and there was too many times last season he would go have a good run and then hobble off the field. And you just went, okay, you can't put together a solid drive because you can't just run right back, hop in the huddle, and then go again and go again. And that's where you want to see your feature back. You want to have a feature back that can continue to go in there and just punish a defense, especially when you're talking about getting into the fourth quarter when things are, you know, if you have a two-touchdown, three-touchdown lead and you just kind of want to run it out and you have a guy that you can put in there and he just picks up five, six yards and demoralizes and dehumanizes a defense and just can, and just, it's, there's no way you stop him that, you know, that was some Jonathan Brooks was getting really good at before his injury was being yeah. able to come in at the end and just stay in the game and just keep running the ball. Uh, so it's good to hear that he is coming out looking good in the pads and with contact, because that was probably the the thing you'd worry about the most with him last season. Yeah. And um, I mean, he's a guy that I, I've heard he's not gained any weight, really, but his body has changed. So I think yeah. he's just kind of transformed the weight that he has uh, that mass into more muscle, which is why he needed armor. He was yes. young and he, that's why those those hits, they, they, they were hurting because he didn't have much armor on. Yeah. Um, and I've heard from the guys coming out of those programs in Florida that sometimes and this is no knock on Florida programs, but they don't have the very sophisticated strength and conditioning programs of schools that in the DFW area are, you know, what I mean that 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 basically look like many you know JUCOs out there, uh, many college campuses. They don't really have that a lot of times. So when those guys get to a college campus, they usually take a huge leap in terms of their body transformation because, uh, or at least more than some of the 
the guys here in Texas just because they haven't had access to it just yet. Um, so good to see that from Cedric Baxter, or at least to hear that about Cedric Baxter. Um, uh, other guys who are kind of rising up or at least starting to separate now that they're, they put the pads on, um, Nato Umio Zulu, the offensive lineman's getting a lot more reps on the first team at that left guard position. Remember, that's the only spot that's really, um, kind of an open competition right now on that offensive line. Everything else seems to be pretty solidified. So between, uh, Neto and, uh, Cole Hudson and Hayden Connor, they've been moving guys around. It looks like he right now seems to be getting most of those reps at left guard. You know, you'll have Kevin Banks, Jake Majors on bookended uh, on both sides of him if he ends up being that starting left guard. Um, and then it looks like Cam Williams is going to end up being, and DJ Campbell, Cam Williams be that right tackle. DJ Campbell's going to be that right guard. It looks like those are your top front line offensive linemen. I do think they want a seven man or eight man rotation. That's why they're cross training some guys. Uh, Cole Hudson, Hayden Connor, trust cross training guys to see what's kind of the best. Uh, combination of five offensive linemen may be. Um, I think in terms of run blocking, I think it's going to be Neto inside along with DJ Campbell inside those guard positions um, and Cam Williams at one tackle and, of course, Kelvin Banks at the other tackle. So that's right now that's another guy that's trending, not they're putting on the pass. Um, shout out to our man CJ Vogel had that report about him working with the first team offensive line left guard. Also, uh, there's a lot of good reports about um, some of the other players, especially on the uh, the, the defensive side of the ball, Jalen Gilbo's getting some love. Uh, there are reports that Jade Barron's cross training. We know that Sark said he's cross training a lot of guys. Jade Barron wants to play corner because he believes in the NFL. He wants to be a corner. Yeah. Corners get paid more money. He wants to be a corner. Um, and I think they're going to cross train him at all three spots. They should because he can play all three spots. But in order to get him to corner or to get him out there situationally, matchup wise, however you want to do it, you need to have somebody you trust that can play the nickel. And Jalen Gilbo looks like he may be the guy that they trust that can play the nickel. Now, Makuba can also play the nickel if you need him. But the reports are Makuba is going to be a safety. It looks great at safety. And that's where he's going to be. Um, so you need somebody else you can put at that nickel spot. Looks like Jalen Gilbo is stepping up to be that that guy. Um, if you want to move Jade Barron around, you need somebody to stabilize the nickel position, and it looks like Jalen Gilbo right now could be that guy. Yeah, that and that that could be that could be a good piece. I, I know that the Jade Barron, you know, one of the interesting is you know they talked about the inset the headset communication uh, that he mentioned at a point he could have had him at that star position. He could have put it over there, but I figure that would mostly be if it was Jade Barron in that position. You figure yeah. that would be Can't more move like around if you, yeah. And so I don't know if that's going to be that may knock yeah. that position out of the running for the headset communication. But yeah, it's good to see. You know, you just want to see more competition in that defensive backs room, just in any sense, form or fashion. You want to see more competition uh, of guys stepping up. That there's more that, that you feel you have more players in that room than you're going to need because that has not been the case the last few years. Yeah, no, I mean, that's uh, that's really good news if Jalen Gilbo stepping up yeah. like that. I think that the defensive backfield could end up being, like I said, strength for the Longhorns this year. Uh, another guy that just continues to get rave reviews is DeAndre Moore, um, even with the pads on. He's going to he's gonna play. DeAndre yeah. Moore is going to be a part of that rece receiving rotation. And remember, I told you guys, or at least my prediction was, they're going to expand the circle of trust of our receivers for Sark. Uh, so DeAndre Moore is going to be in there. We know Jante Cook and Isaiah Bond are going to be part of that group. I think Matthew Golden is going to be part of that group. Yeah. That's four. And then you throw in a Silas Bolden who's not even on campus yet from Oregon State. That would be five. You throw him in there. Now, there's no guarantee he's going to crack it. I think he will. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, how many – what reps guys are going to get or what the target share is going to be. I'm just saying guys that will end up being in a rotation. I think that's five. And then if you include the young Buck Ryan Wingo, I don't know if you want to, you can sprinkle him in there, um, but he's getting a lot of love too about how he's, I think inside text reported that he's ahead of the curve at wide receiver. Um, and he's a five-star guy, a prodigy. So I, I think you'll get at least five guys in the rotation. This will be the, um, I think the heaviest rotation that yeah. Sark has had at wide receiver since he's been at Texas. It wouldn't surprise me guys. early if you had six guys in the rotation pretty heavily and then it got whittled down to five and then maybe four by, by the end of the season. It wouldn't surprise yes, Like yeah. If he kind of finds the guys he can trust yeah. in the guys who are really earn it throughout the season and, and are consistent. Uh, and then I like the reports I was seeing with Ryan Wingo is too, 
that you could see him maybe being used in times where it's not necessarily just as a wide receiver, but in plays, you know, in reverses and other things where it's not always where he's going to be coming down and running a ton of routes, but used situationally where they feel they can put him into a play and let him use his, uh, his speed and his talents to try and break a big play and use his explosive play ability a little bit more than getting a ton of receptions, just going out and trying to catch the ball. He was a great, now I don't know who, it uh, seems like to me, I think Silas Bowden projects to be the punt returner, but he yeah. was a great punt returner in high school too. He's just really, he's just really electric and dynamic with the ball in his hand. So I could, yeah. I could see that and you look at him in high school. He's, he really is. He's next level with the ball in his hands. He's one of those guys that can make you miss in a phone booth and his size. You, it seems like, Oh man, he, he can't move like that, but He's got rare agility for a guy uh, with his size and his frame. All right, uh, good stuff. They're talking some Texas football. We'll get back to that ESPN. There are a couple of ESPN articles actually showing a lot of love to a couple of Longhorns. They're ranking, but they believe they're the top 10 best players in all of college football. Longhorns getting some love there. We'll get into that coming up when we go behind the burn orange curtain again. Uh, but for now, let's get to the uh, big fat poll of the day. On the other side, uh, my man Patrick also will let us know what the musically themed day of the week is. Uh, this is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Long Run. Rod Davis coming right back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Yes, I know the traffic, especially on a Monday, can put you in a certain kind of mood. Uh, nobody likes traffic, but we all love Austin. We all love this great city. And, and you know, honestly, uh, the more and more people that keep moving here, the worse traffic going to get. So let's stop complaining about that and just enjoy the city. It's a great city. Uh, no matter you're talking about the music, you're talking about the food, whether you're talking about all of the great uh, landmarks around here, the iconic landmarks that make this city so unique. And what you may not know about many of those iconic landmarks here in the ATX is that they were built and created by the skilled craftsmanship of hands of Iron Workers Local Union 482, uh, the Pennybacker Bridge, for example, and DKR Stadium. So the folks at Iron Workers Local 482 right now are building a huge project right here in Central Texas. Uh, they're constructing it and they need your help. They're hiring over 3,000 people. They got a huge project happening. They're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits, and a pension plan. They even offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. Uh, Iron, Iron Workers Local 482 don't go to the office. They, they actually build the office. So if you're looking for an exciting employment opportunity or a refreshing career change, you can become a member, a valued member of Iron Workers Local 482. Right now is the perfect time to do it. As I said, they're hiring over 3,000 people. They have numerous positions uh, and they're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits, and a pension plan. You don't even need the skill set to join this prestigious organization. They'll teach you the skills through their apprenticeship program. So right now is the perfect time for you to think about becoming a member of Iron Workers Local 482, and you'll take pride in the type of teamwork and craftsmanship that helps shape the future of our great city. So go online today and inquire about these positions at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org.
Back in the broadcast here on a Monday morning. It is a smooth soul Monday, kicking things off, getting you ready for a week here. We just got through Easter. I hope everybody had a good Easter and a good uh, good Friday and a good weekend. You know, we're, it's a week. It's going to be a good week. So we're starting off with smooth soul Monday, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully, it'll get you in the right mood to start off your week in a positive way. Uh, but let's get okay. to the big fat poll of the day. Text lines open 512-447-3776. Patrick's Big Fat Poll of the Day on the Horn. Big Fat Poll of the Day today. It's easy because we have our final four set. So we'll ask you the easy question. Who will win the NCAA Men's Championship? There's four teams left. You tell me who's going to win. Is it UConn? They look unbeatable right now. Alabama, they've been shooting hot. Purdue. Can Zach Eady go in there and finally get it done in his last year? They've fallen short multiple times before. Is this the year they get it done? Or in NC State, they finish the Cinderella story and uh, win the tournament? Who do you have in your final four? Most of our brackets are busted. I know that. But there's still a few of you out there that went chalk enough. It went Purdue-UConn. You're still alive there if you went really chalk. But... Uh, let me know. What do you think on the text line? We'll put it up on uh, on X as well in a little bit. But uh, what do you think? Who is your uh, who is your national champion for the NCAA men's tournament? I mean, like I said, it's not a lot of drama right now. That's what's that's what's hurting the NC the men's side of the NCAA tournament right now. So they they need. They, I'm glad they got the Cinderella story, so that's good. Uh, but UConn, the way they're playing, not providing a lot of drama, man. A lot of people are gonna be picking UConn all the way. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's it's you you kind you, you want to see you kind get upset. In, in reality, you want to see Alabama versus NC State because if you see that Alabama be, versus NC State, yes. anything can happen. You have, they, all Great bets point. are off at that point. Or yes. if you you could if NC State beats Purdue and then beats UConn, then that may be an all timer, uh, Cinderella story. If you say, or if Alabama to beat UConn and then Purdue, either one of the, if, if, if either team can beat both of those teams, if you have to go through that gauntlet and beat both of them, and then you had to beat, like for, for NC State, if they had to beat Marquette, Duke, Purdue, and UConn to win a national championship, I think you could, you could easily say that team has earned it if they have to do that to win the yeah. championship. Uh, and, and I mean, for for Alabama, if you had to beat you, North Carolina and then UConn and then Purdue, that's a that's a tough one as well. Yeah, no, I'm with you. It's uh, uh no, it, it it could be really intriguing, and hopefully that's the case. But right now, man, like I said, UConn looks really dominant. So I'll take UConn, which are a big fat poll of the day question. But hopefully we get some drama. Hopefully there is some drama uh, with the men's side of the bracket, and we don't end up. Well, if it ends up a UConn versus Purdue, I mean that could end, could that end up being a good matchup. Is UConn yeah. have an answer for Edie? Does I mean that's the an question. Is, again, it's you know if you allow Zach Edie to go inside, and if they're just going to constantly kind of go up and foul him, and he's going to get to the free throw line, then yeah, th this is Zach Edie is that ultimate wild card. Yeah, uh, he's a great equalizer. You just don't know. Yeah, you you just don't know if anybody's going to be able to guard him. The way he's playing right now, he's playing very dominant. He's getting to where he wants to be on the court. He's getting there early, which really hurts teams. So if he's able to continue to get inside against UConn, now Dan Hurley, I'm sure, would throw at him. And the same thing that North Carolina State's going to try and do, which is he was trying to put a body on him basically at the three-point line at the latest to try and just start bumping him early and try and wear him down and don't let him just get two feet from the basket over and over again where your choices are a easy lay-in or a foul. Those are your two choices. They're going to try and bump him out as much as you can. That's why you want to see that DJ Burns, North Carolina State versus Purdue, because Burns is a big enough guy. He can bump him out. So that it'll be interesting to see the post moves and everything else he's got. Yeah, I, I you know, I, it'll be UConn seems to be the favorite because they've been running through everybody. But that may just be that they've got a favorable matchups on the way that they've yeah. been going. So, uh, but let me know on the text line. We'll put it up online as well. Who do you have winning the national championship? Now that we're down to four, who do you got? 
Yeah, uh, good stuff there. Big fat poll of the day. Uh, go check it out, 512-447-3776. All right, we come back. We'll talk some NFL. We'll get back to some hoops conversation, but I want to throw some NFL uh, talk out there. Raj Round today will be about the Dallas Cowboys. Where will they find uh, the, the running back that they need in the draft? Uh, we'll discuss that. Also, they may be looking for a running back at free agency. And OD. Uh, that uh, no, I don't know if it's a goodie anymore, but it's definitely an oldie that uh, Cowboys fans know really well. Uh, we'll get to that coming up. Also, the Texans, a popular uh, landing spot potentially for NFL free agents. Uh, we'll talk about why that is the case on the other side, too. All of that more right here. We'll return with the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers right here on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Let me tell you about Dr. Greg Eckert and his all-star team. As you guys know, I'm a big fan. So is my man Patrick, everybody on the horn. Big fans of Dr. U. He is the official dentist of the horn. He can be yours as well. Uh, Dr. U does a great job. Doesn't matter what you need. It can be anything as simple as just a checkup or a cleaning, uh, like I had to do when I first went to go see uh, Dr. U. Uh, and then I actually realized that I had some issues going on with that checkup. Actually, my uh, wisdom teeth were going in sideways at the time. Uh, it wasn't dire, but it was on its way becoming a disastrous situation, and he wanted to avoid that. Uh, so, Dr. Yu made uh, all the arrangements, uh, educated me, and informed me about the entire process. I was totally comfortable with it, even though usually I have some dental anxiety, but not with Dr. Eckert and his great team. Uh, they ease any, any dental anxiety you may have, uh, and that's what uh, they did for me, and they'll do the same for you as well. So, I got my wisdom teeth removed. I was back at Worth within two days, actually. You guys remember that, and and now my dental health is better than ever. So don't ignore your dental health or your dental hygiene. Uh, make it your top priority. Uh, hit up Dr. U, no matter what it is, a dental cleaning or, uh, like I said, something as simple, let's just say checkup, or maybe it's teeth whitening or dentures or porcelain crowns, veneers, dental implants, full mouth reconstruction, even root canal therapy, whatever it takes to make sure you're getting the best quality dental care available. That's what Dr. Greg Eckert and his team are all about. Now, we call him Dr. U uh, because his last name starts with you, but he's all about you as well. Uh, he's all about making sure you get the best quality dental care available. That's why he's always on the cutting edge of the technological advances in general dentistry. As a matter of fact, uh, he can give you a brand new smile right now in just one day. Permanently secure to your dent dental implants. No time spent without teeth. You'll get temporary fixtures until they complete your permanent smile. And then you're going to smile again with confidence and eat freely without pain or discomfort. It's a lifelike permanent solution. So if you've been told your teeth need to be replaced, don't freak out. Just call Dr. U today to learn about this complimentary consultation, which means you got nothing to lose, but everything to gain of uh, how you can get a brand new smile in just one day, an alternative to dentistry. So hit them up today, 512-345-3166. That's 512-345-3166. Or visit DrEckert.com, D-R-U-E-C-K-E-R-T.com.
Welcome back to the Rodcast. It is a Smooth Soul Monday edition of the Rodcast. My man Patrick Davis, the ideal Yanair, co-host of the Rodcast. He always comes up with the musically themed days of the week. And a Smooth Soul Monday is to make sure you have a smooth transition into the work week. So we always appreciate uh, his thoughts and also his hard work on the show. Also, the big fat poll of the day is up as well. Patrick came up with that and uh, he wants to know who do you think is going to win the uh, men's NCAA championship. Uh, Final four is set Uh, right now. You know, Duke and Alabama, uh, Purdue, you do have your Cinderella story with NC State. Uh, So that's and actually NC State trying to get their uh, women and their men into the the, the women are right? in they are both in the, uh, final the women four. are in yeah, the yes women are in. The so women they're, 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 they have teams in both the men's and women's in the final four it's, it's, yeah, a, it's so, a heck of a feat yeah no that's that's that's, that's great representation obviously uh the longhorn women uh wish that was uh not the case because uh they fall to uh nc state uh over the weekend 76 to 66 and we'll actually hear from a couple of the ladies here coming up uh later on in the show when we get back to talking hoops which we will uh we'll get back to that conversation but that's your big fat poll today who's going to win uh, the championship on the men's side uh 512-447-3776 uh we'll also get back to uh the uh, tournament talk and some nba talk to coming up later on but i want to hit some nfl topics here i want to talk some uh texans i want to talk some cowboys then we'll get into that weird rasheed rice story uh about the hit and run and uh apparently there were some other folks in the car with them and there are pictures now of them fleeing the scene just a weird story uh with rasheed rice the uh kansas city chiefs wide receiver so we'll get to that because that was in Dallas, I believe, too. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, it was in it was in Dallas. So we'll get to that because that's a weird NFL story, too. Very strange NFL story. Um, but also we got your horn headlines coming up. My man Patrick will get to those here coming up momentarily. We also have Rod Rant. Rod Rant will be Cowboys related. We'll talk about where the Cowboys are going to find their running back in the draft, or maybe uh, they'll find running back, uh they'll find some running back help in free agency. That still is a possibility. So we'll talk about the running back position for them after we talk some Texans coming up. Uh, so we got a lot to get into there. There's also a mock draft from Charles Davis and Bucky Brooks out from NFL.com that I want to get into next segment. Um, try to see where the other uh, Longhorns potentially could be uh, right now as we get closer and closer to the draft where they could be mocked in the latest mock draft. So we'll do that and have some fun. You know, I'm a mock slut. I'll look up anybody's mock draft. I always have fun with that. Uh, then we'll have your what the facts, uh, what the stats segment coming up a little bit later on the third segment here in the seven o'clock hour. So around 745, 750, we'll get to what the facts what the stats all right patrick let's not waste any time before we talk some nfl uh let's get the people informed and educated with your horn headlines of the day all right your horn headlines brought to you by top gun rentals and lawn equipment texas women's basketball season ended on sunday with a loss to nc state 76 to 66 madison booker led the way for the longhorns with 17 points but a lack of shooting and a hot wolf pack team put a stop to the horn season in the elite eight South Carolina also punched a ticket to the Final Four with two more teams advancing from games tonight. In the men's tournament, the Final Four is set with UConn, Alabama, Purdue, and NC State all winning over the weekend to advance. North Carolina State will take on Purdue in a matchup including a battle between big men Zach Eady and DJ Burns. In defending champions, UConn will take on the red-hot shooting Alabama. Both Both games will happen on Saturday evening. Texas baseball won their series with Kansas State two games to one, including a 21 to 11 win on Friday night. Jalen Flores had seven RBIs over the weekend, and Max Grubbs put on a solid performance on Saturday, pitching six innings with five strikeouts and only allowing one run. Texas is back in action on Tuesday, facing Abilene Christian. Texas softball struggled in a weekend series against Oklahoma State, dropping the series two to one. Texas was able to pick up a hard-fought win on Friday with Sitlali Gutierrez only allowing one run in the outing. They will now get ready to take on the number one team in the country, Oklahoma, in Austin this upcoming weekend. MLB opening weekend came to a close with the Astros still winless, losing all four games in their opening series to the Yankees. They will try to rebound against the Blue Jays up next. And the Rangers pick up a series win against the Cubs. Rookie phenom Wyatt Langford had hits in all three games. And Adolis Garcia had two home runs and four RBIs to kick off the season. The Rangers start a three-game series with the Tampa Bay Rays this afternoon with pregame beginning at 5.15 right here on the Horde. 
And in the NBA, the Mavericks ended the Rockets' win streak on Sunday to take over the five seed in the Western Conference, where the Spurs lost to the Warriors, moved the Rockets to two games back from Golden State for the last spot in the play-in with eight games to go in the NBA season. And that is your Horn Headlines. All right, thank you, Patrick, for the Horn Headlines. Uh, I appreciate those. We'll get to uh, some, like I said, some hoops discussion there because I know a lot of uh, folks want to talk about the uh, the Final Four. We'll get to that coming up. Also, we're going to hear from um, this, a couple of the, the women uh, from the Texas basketball team about uh, their uh, the loss in the tournament, uh, which is a little disappointing uh, for, for them because I know they had high hopes as a one seed. We'll get to that and also talk about the game tonight between LSU and Iowa on the women's side, uh, which may end up being the highest rated or most watched game of the NCAA tournament on either side. At least if it's anything close to what they did when they played in the national title game uh, last season when they set records for uh, tournament records, ratings records for not only women's college basketball, but just college basketball, period. I mean, it was a a ratings monster. All right, so we'll get to that conversation coming up. Let's talk NFL here because Saquon Barkley went on the uh, the, the, uh, Kelsey Brothers podcast, and he was just talking about his free agency experience uh, and and obviously an eagle now coming from the New York Giants. But he had a nice little nugget, nice little tidbit, uh, talking about who his preferred team was, or at least his preferred teams were in the NFL free agency. Um, and as a Texans fan, I got a little giddy when I heard this. Here is Saquon Barkley. You did that. There were, there, there were rumors eventually, or in the beginning, that the Eagles were kind of in it. Were they always kind of like the top choice, or they, were they the ones kind of trying to make that move happen? Or <sighs> let's be, I'm gonna be honest here, right? This is what this is what the show is for. Really, I mean, probably the first team that had like my first interest was Houston. Ooh, it was Houston. That would have been, um, been was, dangerous too. It was really. Uh, I got to communicate uh, with CJ and a couple of those boys. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. Uh, but this is before like all the, you know, when you actually put offers on the table and talk to teams, and um, then as it got closer and you start hearing word, and it's like okay, like you know, Philly. I, I probably never imagined myself playing for Philly. You know, six years ago. Yeah, sure. Uh, but it was like I get to come back to Pennsylvania. My family's from Pennsylvania. My lady, our kids, like grandmas, all that's from um, Pennsylvania. So we get to – we're already close. We even get to get closer. Uh, there you go. So uh, it was true. Remember, we uh, heard all the rumors that, oh, man, looks like I think Saquon, the their mutual interest between Saquon, Saquon's group and the Texans. Now, he admitted that he was just talking to CJ. Yeah. He wasn't talking necessarily to the – the team and to management and to the front office, the GM or Nick Casario or the execs, but it, it, it I, obviously CJ can just go talk to Nick Casario. I mean, th- there's a documented story and reports that he's the one that recommended they draft Tank Dale. So they're mm-hmm. going to listen to their star quarterback. Uh, if he says, Hey man, y'all should be interested in, in, in uh, Saquon Barkley. And I believe there was, there are multiple reports. The Texans made an offer. The, the Philadelphia Eagles just made a better offer. And that's the one that he took. Uh, but good to know that, you know, CJ's number one, CJ Strauss actively recruiting. Yep. Right. That's number one. That's that, that to me, that's the most important little uh, nugget I got from that is that CJ is actively recruiting. He's hitting up guys like, hey, man, you're a free agent. Hey, man, you interested in Houston? OK, let me pass that along to uh, to Nick and just let him know that, hey, there there is interest. Right. I can do that. By the way, players can't tamper. That's not tampering or anything like that. You actually can't do that. So that's number one. And number two, I do think, you know, it just shows you the perception of the Texans is changing rather quickly. I saw the report from Pro Football Talk. Uh, that Daniil Hunter, who, by the way, kind of like Saquon, who wanted to, who said that one of the, I guess, incentives of him signing with the Eagles is that he goes back to where, you know, he's got a lot of family there. His wife's got family there. Uh, so that is that connection. Daniil Hunter, similarly from the Houston area. So I'm sort of planning in front of his family. As he said, that meant a lot to him. Uh, there was talk that he gave the Texans a hometown discount. Well, Pro Football Talk confirmed that. You know, they said Daniil Hunter actually was offered more money by the Colts. Uh, than the deal that he signed for the Texans, but he signed, he decided to sign with the Texans, maybe also because of the family connection and the hometown, of course, discount, but also I think the Texans now offer, uh, you know, players like Daniel Hunter and like a Saquon Barkley, big time free agents, you know, a chance to be on a team that could now compete for a championship division championship first, but then of course a conference championship and then maybe even the Super Bowl once they start building this roster and they complete the roster construction in Nick Casario's vision. 
Yeah, and I think uh, D'Amico Ryan's is one of those guys that I think, especially defensive players, are you know kind of gravitate to, and there's guys that want to be a part of that D'Amico Ryan's team uh, because of what the energy he's brought and and what he's brought to Houston and everything for being the guy who wants to go play there. Who you know they say they want to bring in guys from Texas because they have that pride. Just everything that D'Amico Ryan's just kind of started to put around this team. And what he's built, that culture that D'Amico Ryan's is building, I think that once you know people want to kind of be part of that as well. That when you throw that in, when you throw in a CJ Stroud, and people can look, and I know Indy has Anthony Richardson, they're very happy with him, and they think he's going to be really special too. But I think people see CJ Stroud, and they, you know, it's somebody they go, man, this guy could be the best quarterback in the NFL. There's no promises, no guarantees, but he could be. He has a potential to be that guy. So if we look at those pieces and say, I've got a coach that I really want, i got a quarterback I really want, and I'm going to go, I believe in myself that I'll go be the guy, maybe I'll take a little bit less, you know, it, and it's it's not a ton less. Plus, again, you throw in the fact Texas versus Indy, no state income tax is always going to be an issue. Uh, that's, you know, that difference of $1 million or $2 million may end up after taxes not being the same. They, you could yeah. technically may make more in Texas. Uh, no, I, I totally agree with that. No question. Um, that's a big part of it, too. It just, I, I think that now the Texans can go out and recruit big time free agents. That was not the case because um, they are an attractive landing spot because of C.J. Stroud. You just brought up D'Amico Ryans. I think he's a player's coach, especially defensively. I think a lot of guys want to play for D'Amico Ryans. And it, right now, the Texans are, I hate to, hate to say it because I don't want to jinx it, they're a trendy pick for a lot of folks right now early yeah. on in the offseason, even prior to the draft. Because they've situated themselves uh, right now, where they don't have a lot of holes on their roster, and played at multiple teams. Uh, sorry, multiple analysts uh, when they're looking at the NFL teams who could threaten the the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, there have been more than a few that have set the Texans right now in a prime position to be that team. Uh, we'll see if they can follow through on that. Winning the division and making the playoffs uh, in the first year for a rookie head coach and a rookie quarterback. As I told you, you got they hadn't had it since 1920. You got to go back to the, the, the Decatur Staley's with I believe it was George Hallis as the as a player coach, and I think you had Dutch Sternman. It was long time ago. Um, so you could be we could be you know watching something a rare uh, combination right now of. D'Amico Ryan's of hiring the right coach, D'Amico Ryan's, and finding your franchise quarterback in that same year. You just don't really see that. And it looks like Nick Casario could be the real deal. Still never really found out who won executive of the year. Did we ever find that out? Well, no, it was it was the Detroit Lions. It was the Lions, it was yeah. GM. It was Brad Holmes. I believe it was him. Um, but man, I thought that Nick Casario had a really good shot at it. Yeah, we didn't I, he's see, like, the he's got a shot at it again this that. year, though, so far. He, he's starting off the year like that. Great point. Yeah, I guess the start of the new year, technically, yeah, his free agency period has been uh, highly praised. His free agency acquisitions have been highly praised. Great point. We'll see what he does in the draft. Last year, he had more trades than any other GM in the NFL in that draft, and he's had more trades than any other GM in the NFL since he became uh, the Texans GM. He's made a lot of moves, including firing two coaches already, uh, but <laughs> It, it, right now, it looks like even him firing the two coaches, if it took that dysfunction for him to find his the right guy in D'Amico Ryans, then it was well worth it for the Texans there. Um, okay, let's get to uh, Rod's round of the day because I got a Cowboys take here. Cowboys need a running back, and there are right now reports that they are interested in one in free agency, um, but also I'll talk about where they could find that running back in the draft. Let's get to the rant of the day. Mm. 
Uh, right now, looks like at least in the off season, uh, Texas and Cowboys are polar opposites of one another in terms of how active they've been, the amount of money they're spending. They're in different situations, though. Um, the Cowboys need to find themselves a running back, uh, whether in the draft or in free agency, um, because right now they don't really have a a starter, a starting running back right now. There are some other holes on the roster, but that's one of them. And there's a report that the Cowboys are really interested in bringing back Ezekiel Elliott, who turns 29, I believe, in July. Um, I believe if you look at what he did last season with the Patriots, signed a one-year deal worth $3 million. Remember, the Cowboys are actually still paying. I believe he still counts about $6 million in dead money, uh, in dead cap charge for the Cowboys in 2024. So I think technically you are still paying for Zeke. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I don't know if that's bad business to bring him back or not. I don't know. It's like having sex with your ex-wife when you're still paying the other Like, I don't know if that's bad or not. It's probably bad. Probably, probably shouldn't be doing it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but Elliot, he did play in 51% of the offensive snaps uh, for the Patriots. Uh, he did lead them in rushing with 642 yards, but he only averaged three and a half yards per carry. Um, he did have 51 receptions, though he's catching the football a lot. I think he right now is short yardage wise. He'd probably be a nice weapon for the Cowboys, and the Cowboys actually do need a short yardage weapon. Um, so maybe bringing him in situationally to be the short yardage weapon, I don't know how much he'd cost, but that's something that the Cowboys, at least they're reportedly, there's mutual interest in. The Cowboys are at least thinking about it. Um, they're doing their due diligence on bringing Zeke back. That to me would be the, the irony of that, <laughs> of the Cowboys coming full circle and bringing Zeke back. It would not be, I don't think it would be a pleasant irony at all for Cowboys fans to have Zeke come back into the fold and him end up essentially being your featured running back. He should not be the featured running back. There's a reason he moved on from him. Uh, you can't build a running game around Zeke. They got to find a running back in the draft. There's no doubt. Because right now in free agency, there aren't any high level potential featured running backs that are left in free agency. They're all kind of complimentary boutique pieces yeah. that you can bring to your backfield, but they're not main course running backs, workhorse running backs. Yeah. And I mean, and they have to figure out what they're going to do of, you know, if you, if you bring in Zeke and you want him to be on the active roster, then, you know, where are you, are you going to be able to draft your feature back? Because are you carrying four running backs on your roster? Do you knock Deuce Vaughn down to practice squad? That is a question on board because right now you have two running backs on your roster, Enrico Doddle and Deuce Vaughn. And yeah. so you have basically a spot for one more that you can put on your everyday active roster. That's what they did last season. Now you can move Deuce Vaughn down. He says he's another year out of college. Uh, you know, we don't think anybody's going to try and pick him up off our practice squad to put on an active roster. We don't think that's going to be the case. So we can go ahead and, and risk putting him down. We didn't want to do it last season. Uh, but you have to make those are the hard decisions. And if you bring in Zeke, that decision becomes that much harder because if you don't have your guy, one of those guys you have to make available on, you know, by sending down to the practice squad and having all those conversations, it just becomes an even harder discussion to have that, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's a great idea to just load up on guys that should be getting, you know, five, six carries a game. Yeah, no, you gotta, you might, like you said, you might have to wait till after the draft, or you can just pick them up now and you can cut them later. Practice squad now gives you yeah. some flexibility that you brought up with a guy like Deuce Vaughn. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to figure out what the Cowboys' plan is going to be. Now, I will say, I, I saw some research, um, and Cowboys Wire is where I got it from. So good, uh, good work by them. If you look at the stat, it's a deep analytical stat, uh, rushing yards over expectation. You look at the top. 10 running backs in the NFL uh, in that stat, rushing yards over expected, um, which, you know, I get into the deep dive, but essentially it's their way of saying running backs who outperform their, their status, outperform their contract, those kind of players are so rushing yards over expected. Um, and the average draft spot for the top 10 um, running backs uh, in RYOE um, their average draft position is a uh, 155. Mm. Uh, like it, so the average draft spot is at 155 based on pro football Focus's top 10 average. Um, if you look at their top 10 pro football focus scores 
and where their top running back is drafted, um, it's at 108.2. So day three. Yeah. If you're looking at deep analytics, uh, R-Y-O-E, um, and their top 10 running backs, the average draft spot for their top 10 running backs is 155. The pro football focus, you look at their top 10 running backs on average, the average spot is 108. Um, that's kind of running backs drafted in top three of the top 10 graded running backs in 2023. Only one Christian McCaffrey was drafted in the first round. Five were drafted on the second day. That's rounds two through three. All right. Three were drafted in the fifth round and one went undrafted altogether. So if for the sake of argument, if the undrafted player, if you give him a draft slot, say give him whatever, just a random 265, um, the average draft spot of the top 10 running back comes in, like I said, at around 108.2. That would be right at the top of the fourth round, bottom of the third round. That's where the Cowboys, it, they can't let that, at least that position in the draft, around that area in the draft, they probably need to start. If they don't have a running back already drafted, that's where they need to start looking for one, right around that spot. Yeah, you so can't let it slide third, further than early that. fourth. Okay, yeah. Yes, you can't. If, if you let it slide further than that, then the, the likelihood of you getting a starting running back out of that group is going to be very, very low, minuscule. Yeah. So and, it, just look at the stats. And sure. that's, and that's you know, this is a uh, a weaker running back class than most. There just isn't a great running back class this year. Great point. So Patrick. if you, if you put point. into that, that, you know, that's the normal average, and we're a little bit behind that. If you slip further in and you're trying to pick up one in the fifth or sixth round, yeah, that, I don't know if that's the right way. It feels like that's one of those positions that you just have to make a pick on. You maybe have to reach on. You maybe have to try and make a run at, uh, or you make a trade on draft day. You just it feels like some that's one of those positions that you really, really have to address more than any because even offensive line, there's a point where I can say, well, maybe they have somebody on that roster that they feel that's why they were okay with letting Biotis walk away. Maybe they feel like they have some guys on that roster that can fill in some holes, and they'll be able to find some guys at offensive line. They'll be able to patchwork that one a little bit more. We know they don't have a running back. We can, you know, we can say for sure thing they don't have one. Uh, and so, you know, we can say in defensive tackle, we can say maybe Mozzie Smith. They feel they're going to be able to have him take turn a corner in second year. So maybe they don't need to worry about that defensive tackle. I also think they're going to take an offensive lineman in the first round, but. Uh, I think that there's places in there where you could say, okay, you can kind of patchwork around this, and I think you can make that work. Uh, linebacker, you know, Overshawn's coming back this year, so they feel like they're getting a draft pick in that in a pretty weak linebacker class. That yeah, they feel they're they're Sanya. getting a really yeah. good linebacker that's probably better than a linebacker that they could get in this year's draft for where they're gonna be where they'd be picking him. So there's there's positives you can put uh, that they feel, but running back just feels like that position that if you don't address it. It was an issue last year, and you had a better running back in Tony Pollard, and it was still an issue that you really need to find something out rather than, oh, well, we screwed it up. I guess we'll bring back Zeke, and you know he'll play like he did six years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it just yeah. doesn't no, seem right. like a real solution. I'm, I'm with, That's a great point, though. At least you have some reinforcements at other positions you, it, it's hope and you're hoping that they work out you're yeah hoping that you're, you're looking at it from a glass half full kind of perspective but at running back there is no glass there's no water in the glass like you no. talk, I mean, there's nothing there there's no way to even look at it you have deuce von and rico dotto those guys are just not starting um i would think i kind of workhorse main course frontline running backs for you. They they are complimentary pieces. Cowboys got to figure something else out at the running back position. Um, so there you go. Whether uh, even Zeke, I, that's not an answer. I think we all agree that's not that's not the answer. Maybe Zeke wasn't an, an answer two we, years ago. Yes, yeah, so Zeke's not an answer. And I don't know if Dalvin Cook is an answer. I don't know if the answer is in free agency right now. No, I, I, I now I, again I'll say you pick up the phone and call the Texans, but that's just an easy off the top of the head that Damian Pierce is probably a guy that the Texans are willing to move on from. Yeah. So yep. if you say yeah. that that's somebody that I, you know, if you want to make a trade, there's probably a few guys around the league like that that you can make a phone call and say, well, if you're willing to move on on draft day, we could pick somebody in that late third fourth round but we'd rather take somebody who's a bit more ready to play week one because we need someone to start week one for us 
Uh, and so we maybe take somebody that we feel has a little bit more, uh, you know, years in the league and, and isn't older, but, you know, someone that maybe didn't work out for your roster for whatever reason, we'll go ahead and take them in and we'll let you take that rookie in the same spot you're talking about in that early fourth round window. If you give up a fourth round pick for it, which is a little high for a running back, but at the same point, uh, I think Damian Pierce for a fourth, if you say fits in the right system, is not a terrible trade for either side. Yeah, no, the Cowboys may look to the trade market, but they they need their draft picks. They have so many holes that they got to fill. They do, they but need, but if you're addressing, with, and, and, but I'm saying they need to fill it with cheap talent too. Uh, so I, I I don't mind a Damian Pierce thing. I brought that up actually a couple of yeah. weeks ago. I don't mind that, but my point is they they also need their draft picks. Like they can't afford to be trade like a fourth round pick. Usually it's like oh man, it's a luxury. We can we can trade that away. Not the Cowboys. Well, and not this Cowboys. Well, team. and then throw away th- add this into the equation. <laughs> That this is a Maybe Cowboys team years. that well, but that you can't trade away next year's because you're possibly rebuilding next year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not totally aggressive. Play. You, you cannot waste draft picks right now because exactly, if you end up blowing this thing up, you're gonna need every draft pick you got, especially the ones in the middle, the the middle to the upper rounds, the, the top and the middle rounds. Maybe you can trade away late round draft picks, but the Cowboys right now they're in a dire situation where they need cheap labor. Um, and if they don't figure out the DAC thing, things are gonna be even more dire. Good point about that. All right, we come back. We'll uh get into a uh, mock drafts. A couple of mock drafts I want to throw out there. Uh, you guys know I love me some mock drafts. Uh Charles Davis of NFL Network, Bucky Brooks both have mock drafts out, uh came out this, this past weekend. We'll get into that where the Longhorns uh stand in the latest mock drafts, how many of them are projected to be in the first round. We'll get into that and also uh talk about some other uh, news notes and nuggets uh from the NFL world. That was she Rice story is interesting. If we don't get to it, we'll get into it and off the record. But that is a weird story. I think the police are still looking for Rasheed Rice, or at least he hadn't turned himself in. We'll get to that story coming up on the other side right here. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming right back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Other than the traffic, we all acknowledge that Austin is a great city, one of the best cities in America. And as the city continues to grow and thrive, so do our friends at Iron Workers, local Union 482. Uh, many of the iconic landmarks around town that make this city so unique were actually built and uh, crafted and created by the skilled craftsmanship of Iron Workers, local Union 482, uh, uh, i.e., the, the Pennybacker Bridge and D. Kara Stadium are two examples of them. And right now, they have another big project happening right here in Central Texas, and they're hiring over three. 3,000 people to help them complete this project and you can be one of these uh, very lucky folks. Right now they're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits and a pension plan. They even offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. So right now is the perfect time for you to become a valued member of this prestigious organization, Iron Workers Local 482. They don't go to the office, they actually build it. So if you're looking for an exciting employment opportunity or you want a refreshing career change, now is the perfect time for you to become a member of Iron Workers Local 482. You can maximize your potential and accept the challenge of becoming the best version of yourself simply by going online today at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org.
Welcome back to the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis. My man Patrick Davis always uh, coming up with the great ideas. That's why we call him the Idillionaire. He's the one that comes up with the musically themed days of the week. And today is a smooth soul Monday uh, to get you a, a smooth transition headed uh, into uh, your work week. So we appreciate my man Patrick and all of uh, his efforts. Uh, okay, let's get to some uh, NFL discussion here. I, I've been seeing a couple of mock drafts, and I'm starting to notice a little bit of a trend, and it's uh, a little worrisome from a Texas perspective. I thought Texas would have three players drafted in the first round this year, first time since 1980. That would be the case. Byron Murphy, uh, Xavier Worthy, and A.D. Mitchell. And I will say um, some of the mock drafts I've seen, and not the mock drafts mean a damn thing. They're just uh, fun to kind of speculate, throw out there, hypothesize exactly what teams are going to do. And some some, some are more connected than others, especially uh, the guys over at NFL Network and some of the guys like Mel Kuyper and uh, Dane Brugler, Matt Miller, those kind of guys. So uh, I try to bring you guys, even though I'm a mock slut, I try to bring you guys only the most reputable, uh, distinguished mock drafters out there. Uh, and Charles Davis <clears throat> over at NFL.com and of NFL Network and Bucky Brooks, both those guys do a really good job. They both have mock drafts out, and I noticed uh, something with both of their mock drafts, and I'll give you the Texans and the Cowboys and where they finished, but uh, in regards to the Longhorns, only one Longhorn in the first round of each of their mock drafts, and I've noticed that more and more. I don't know what, and I, maybe it's just uh, post – combine um silly season stuff which is just silly season everybody's just throwing around whatever uh just whatever either rumors they hear or just try to spice things up to try to get more clicks so we could be silly season stuff but i have seen um more mock drafts with fewer longhorns in the first round byron murphy is the only longhorn in the first round of these two mock drafts for bucky brooks uh bucky brooks has them going i believe to the Rams. Yes, you got Byron Murphy going to the Rams. Makes sense. They need a new D tackle, uh, and uh, they just had Aaron Donald tr- uh, so, uh, retire. So you, th- that makes sense in terms of filling a void there. Uh, and then Charles Davis, he has Byron Murphy as the only Longhorn going in his first round of his mock draft, and he's got him going 17th to the Jaguars um, to kind of bolster their run defense and their defensive line. But that's it uh, for both of those guys. So really interesting because early on, right around the combine, right before it, right after it, um, man, it seems like uh, the trend was three Longhorns in the first round of the draft. That has not been uh, the case. Uh, where, where the Cowboys are drafting in these mock drafts, uh, they do have a Cowboys going with an offensive lineman in the first round. Um, something we talked about, Patrick, you just mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, Troy Fautanu. Uh, is where Charles Davis has him. Uh, Charles Davis has the Cowboys scoring, excuse me, in the first round. And if you look at the Bucky Brooks one, he's got him going Graham Barton, a Duke offensive lineman, uh, in the first round. Remember, Texas traded out of their first round pick, so they don't have one um, on any, any of these mock drafts. So there you go. Cowboys will be taking the first round offensive lineman. It looks like every, there's a consensus on it. I haven't seen a first round mock with them taking anything else. Um, and I don't know, one of the trends I think is developing in the mock world, fewer Longhorns going in the first round. Um, so Matt, not as confident as I once was, Patrick, that three Longhorns would be taken in the first yeah. round. I still feel confident two will, but I'm not as confident that three will. Three is a lot, and that's the reason they haven't had three since 1980, no matter how good they've done. Yeah, and I mean, it is going to be rough to get three in there. Uh, I, I will say the Bucky Brooks one looked like it was made with a few picks that he really wanted to make splashes with and then did the rest around it. Like he had, I got you. he had Drake May going eleventh in that yeah, draft. Yeah, Drake May's not going to drop that far. Yeah, and that's he is the only person I've seen have Drake May drop below three, and yeah, he has him at eleven. So yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. So there's there's some things. There was a couple of picks in there where you go like, oh, he wanted to put them there, and so he moved other things around. So I won't necessarily put that there. I will. Admit, I will say though, when we talk about silly season, it's not always the worst thing to have your guys stop being talked about a little bit because that does sometimes mean that GMs and everybody are starting to get a little bit more tight-lipped about a certain players, and scouts may be getting a little bit more tight-lipped because they don't necessarily want to keep hyping up a guy, and now you're starting to see some other guys. Uh, you know, uh, J.J. McCarthy, or yeah, J.J. McCarthy is one of those guys that people feel is really getting a lot of hype because a certain people want him to get drafted high. 
and not because they yeah. think he's great, but because they think, man, if you can, if we can get him to get a little bit higher, the the theory, the conspiracy theory on that is they're hoping that JJ McCarthy can slip into four, and then let uh, Jim oh, Harbaugh. Drop. Jim Harbaugh is going to pump up McCarthy the entire time to then allow himself at number five to get the first pick of any other player he wants in the draft that's not a quarterback because he already has a quarterback. So, uh, yeah, no, there, there's, the there's theories like that, but I think he also just is hyping up the kid that from his own class. But, uh, but there are, you know, they're going to start hyping up other guys that maybe they're not going to be drafting just to try and get their guys to fall down a little bit to them. So it does not mean the end of the world if people are starting to look away. Uh, Field Yates did put out his uh, updated top 50 over the weekend, and he still has A.D. Mitchell as the 20th best player in the draft on his rankings. Yeah. So he still has him really high up there uh, and is the fifth best wide receiver. So uh, there are guys that still have A.D. Mitchell, especially going pretty high. Uh, Xavier Worthy, I believe, was uh, 30-something, 37th yeah. or something. So he's still, a bit, you know, that's the, Xavier Worthy, I think, is the bigger question is is there a team in the first round who's going to go out and bet on speed or is he going to be a high second round pick where they want a little less guaranteed money but they still like the speed but the size maybe scares them a little bit more the thing that could uh push the longhorns out of the first round is just because now you have like michael Penix was a guy that wasn't considered a first rounder and now you have teams that or at least you have some mock drafts yeah. that are considering him to be a first rounder too. So you're right about that. I think you know you're just adding to some of the premium positions that weren't 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 necessarily a premium position. And this is a really good offensive tackle draft. I, I saw as Land Zerline ranked all the positions in the draft. Uh, and he thinks offensive tackle is the deepest position in the draft. And there's a lot of high level offensive tackles uh too that are gonna get drafted early. So basically you're a top picks early on in the first round are going to be quarterbacks offensive tackles and wide receivers that's why i'm with you i think ad mitchell's in the first round just because they're gonna be so many wide receivers go in the top 15 and you might have four wide receivers go in the top 15 and then he's considered the fifth or the sixth best wide receiver he's definitely going to get drafted somewhere in the first round maybe at the end of it uh, not sure about uh, xavier worthy i think some team has xavier worthy or some teams plural have him circled so if he drops, they're going to trade up for him. I still believe yeah. he's going to get traded for. I think JT Sanders could end up being a guy that's traded for. I think T Tavondre Sweat, JT Sanders, and Xavier Worthy are prime candidates for teams to trade up for just because although they may not necessarily have the overall athletic profile to be considered a first-round pick, they could be like perfect additions to someone's roster and someone's per like system that they have. Like a Devondre Sweat yeah. can be a perfect uh, addition to a, a defensive system that needs a guy that can plug multiple holes for you, demand a double team um, as that kind of rock of Gibraltar in the middle of your defense. Xavier Worthy can be the perfect addition to a system. It's like, no, we just need somebody with ridiculous speed that they have to respect that can take the top off a of defense. He's got that ability. JT Sanders is just a high-level tight end. Athletically, he didn't show out at the combine or in the pro day. But if you watch the film on him, you know, oh, man, the translates is a guy that can win downfield, and he can do that right away at the NFL level. Like blocking, yeah, you got to work on some things. But in terms of him being able to just win one-on-ones in the NFL, you know he can do that right away. And there may be a team that all they need is a another tight end that can win – you know, we even got a first, we got a first team tight end. We got a number one tight end. We need a number two. Another guy can go out there and win yeah. one-on-ones and play situations going up against a safety, going up against a linebacker. That's what JT can do for you right now. So it's more of a luxury pick, but I think, I think teams see them as ideal additions because of their unique skill set. Uh, uh, like I said, Tavondre Sweat, uh, one of those guys I think will end up being traded for, if not multiple. Yeah, uh, players. No, I agree, and for. and I also uh, I'll say that you know we we see that some guys have up to six quarterbacks going in the first round. I think four is a more reasonable number. Uh, we see it four a lot like where yeah. you know early on you say, well, all these teams were going to go try and get a quarterback, but once the first three or four get picked, your competition of how many teams are actually looking for a quarterback now that are willing to draft one in the first round drops yeah. considerably, and now those guys are bidding against themselves. And, you know, throwing away a first round pick at number pick 16, let's throw it away on a quarterback. We can get him next round 
and we can trade into the second round and trade up and get him early in the second round. What the Titans did for Will Levis last year when Will Levis was at one point projected number three overall in some yeah. mock drafts, and he ends up going in the second round. I think that's more likely for a guy like Bo Nix and Michael Penix that are a little bit older, and maybe they'll want them on that that second round contract. Maybe they don't want to use that first round pick on a, uh, a position that they're not sure is going to be the starter for them next season or the year after. So I, I could see either of them, which then opens up more space for for a guy like X, X Man to sneak back into that first round. Yeah, yeah, it, it's all about if you're a Longhorn fan, you're rooting for a lot of receivers to go early. Yeah, because the, the more and more receivers that go early, the higher the likelihood that Xavier Worthy will be drafted at the end of the first round. Which means, and by the way, the Rasheed Rice story, which we'll get into um, at one point here, uh, that's that bodes well for. A.D. Mitchell and Xavier Worthy going to Kansas City. Remember, they've been mocked heavily to, to Kansas City prior to the combine, after the combine, and everybody thought the addition of Hollywood would mean, okay, well, they're not, they're no longer interested in the wide receiver in the first round. Uh, no, well, Rasheed Rice getting in trouble, and I don't know exactly how, you know, what the severity of the punishment is going to be for him, what the consequences will be, because I don't even know if the police have have actually caught up with him yet, or if he's turned himself in, I don't think that's happened yet. Um, but if, you know, they're worried about him being able to contribute because of some off the field issues, maybe they still go after drafting wide receiver. Maybe they want to move on from Rasheed Rice. Cause maybe they're like, nah, we don't want to be heavily invested in this guy. If he's eh, making bad decisions like and, that. And then remember Let's, Hollywood Brown signed a one year deal. Yeah, he did. So yeah. if you're drafting a rookie, that means we can try and build on this and Hollywood will be a, a bridge. To the next guy could be yeah that would be i say either one of those guys going to kansas city would be great news for their career yeah. x-man or ad mitchell uh, all right good stuff there we'll come back and we'll get into what the facts what the stats got some nba and ncaa tournament stats to share so we'll get into some more hoops discussion on the other side this is broadcast featuring patrick davis i'm lifetime longhorn rod Babers coming right back on the horn
All right, welcome back to the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Local with Rod Davis. Time for what the facts, uh, what the stats here. Uh, all right, a couple of uh, hoops related stats and factoids here. Uh, did you know that three of the four coaches going to the final four on the men's side were a high school or prep school coaches in 2010? Um, that plus the, uh, if you go look at it, uh, because Danny Hurley, uh, UConn coached at St. Benedict's in New Jersey. Uh, Kevin Keats of NC State coached, uh, at Hargrave in Virginia. Nate Oates of Alabama coached at Romulus in Michigan. Um, and if you go look at, uh, throw that Bucky McMillan story in there, uh, had that plus obviously the success he had at Samford. Uh, maybe it, they're looking at maybe a possibility of more. I don't know, more of these coaches coming from the high school ranks, uh, from successful high school programs. Is that a trend that you could see, Patrick? Does that even, or is this just an anomaly, some outlier? No, I mean, it's good to start it, you know, start off young and go. I think, you know, you talk about the difference of ex players necessarily and guys who didn't play professionally. Uh, maybe that'd be the case. But yeah, guys who probably to start off their coaching career, like to say Dan Hurley had to start off and build his way up when he comes from a coaching family. Yeah. That, that there's, there's some extent to it. Yes, he did. It was good for him to not, you know, basically walk into being an assistant right away and be handed some things. He had to, you know, work as being a head coach a bit more uh, and work his way up that way. I, I think it to each, it's to each their own. You can find your own way to get where you need to get. Uh, recruiting wise, it's probably helpful. Uh, in you know, Definitely trying to be helpful. able, it may be helpful yeah. in a world where coaching styles have to be a little bit different now. That maybe high school coaching can be a little bit, you know, could be a, a precursor because you have guys that will, you know, they'll just quit, they'll just walk off the team if you don't. Yeah, it, you know, it's not necessarily a world where they're in the same position. I think where it has a value too, I think you're right on the money there, but I think also where it holds value when you're recruiting, um. Essentially, every high school coach wants to be you like they want yeah, to yeah. accomplish what you accomplish and get to your level and to be able to say that, hey, man, I was a high school coach once. Or I, I do think it holds a lot of uh, merit. I do think it brings a lot of credibility, street cred, if you will, almost with high school coaches. Yeah. Um, and and, and then they, if I say they aspire to be where you are, but it does. I think it's a weird way that you can relate to high school coaches, even if you're for a short time. Like you said, Dan Hurley didn't need to do it, but he still chose to do that right go that route and i think it makes you more relatable it, it does and, I, and i'm sure there's a factor in it too of just when you're trying to judge the character of people how many of these high school coaches how many people go into coaching because they want to affect young men's lives and, and you know be a part of that yeah and a high school coach maybe is more than somebody who really wants to be an nba coach and they love basketball and everything else but they're not necessarily in it for you know the student athletes the kids are not in it for that as much. They're much more in it of, no, we're coaching basketball. I don't care. Show up at practice. Yeah. We're playing basketball. Uh, and that that philosophy doesn't always work, especially in a world now where there's NIL, where there's a transfer portal, that if you aren't don't truly care about these kids, and there's going to be points where kids will walk away. Yeah, no, you're right about that. Some uh, There are some people whose passion is literally to help kind of mold the yeah. next generation of, of 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 our community, and that's a big part of it. Yes, yeah, some I know a lot of coaches who are like that, and that's the right reason to be in it, um, not necessarily for the money or for the fame or to reach the highest level. All right, uh, another factoid for you, and what the facts, what the stats, the uh, Astro, the Astros, which right now looking like the disastros, but it's a long season, and we just started. Uh, they're zero and four, Patrick. Uh, yes. They lost uh, their last uh, match. I'm uh, sorry, the last game, four three to the Yankees uh, in that uh, matchup for the first time since 1978. Houston is swept in a four game series to open the season. Haven't happened since 1978, since before I was born. Been a long time, and that goes back to last season. The Astros have lost 11 of their last 12 games at home, dating back to last year, including the playoffs. And we know that. Unfortunately, four of those were to the Rangers in the ALCS. Uh, going back there, they've lost nine consecutive games at home, dating back to last postseason. Yeah, I don't know if they fixed that that batter's eye that they were talking about last season where the home field Here. advantage was not there for the Astros at all. I don't know. if you, It seems like they had to have tried to adjust that in the offseason. If they didn't, that's just terrible. Uh, but, yeah, they, yeah, it's 
I, it's not panic mode at all. But yeah, the, no. last season, I remember they started off real slow and it was much more an excuse of, well, the World Baseball Classic, a lot of Astros were playing in that. So the spring training wasn't there. That excuse is not there right now. Uh, and they still were just not able to put the hits together. Uh, you know, Abreu was suspended the first two games of the season because of that ALCS uh, against the Rangers. So, you know, there was some pieces of it, but you shouldn't have been swept in that series at all. D- disappointing. Disappointing is the word I'd use to start it off, especially because it's the Yankees. You just don't want to see that yeah. against the Yankees. It, uh, it's but, supposed to be a rival now of the Yankees. Come on. Hey, but maybe maybe get a little bit more, a uh, little fire in that belly. Maybe get a little too much success in the past few years for the Astros. Get them pissed off again. Uh, they do play really well when they're pissed off. Uh, Cause, when they're cause I'll tell you this, the Rangers don't look like they've lost a step. Yeah, and that's why I think the no remember last year this was the the conversation happening with the Astros because they were better on the road than yeah. they were at home, and the thought process was psychologically because of what this team has gone through, becoming the villain. All right, after the cheating scandal and then yeah. having to bounce back and then win another championship to prove themselves, that they actually psychologically were better when they were hated, and they performed yeah. better when they were hated and they were villains and they were always that on the road. And they were better on the road than they were at home. Because at home, they were loved and they were cheered. And everybody yeah. talked about how great they were because we love the Astros. But psychologically, this is a team that plays better as the villain when they're hated. Um, and at least that was that's the theory that was thrown out there last year. And maybe it's still the case. I don't know how they solved it. They didn't solve it in the playoffs. No. <laughs> no. And um, they're going so, to have to work on that bullpen as well. Uh, we, even with the Brayu, yeah. uh suspended, Ryan Presley didn't look necessarily great in his new role. Uh, Josh Hader looked pretty good. The signing did, but mm-hmm. they lost a lot of innings uh, that they lost to free agency this year. And uh, they're going to have to figure out some guys to step up in that rotation. Hopefully get some young guys going there as well. It's good stuff. Uh, we'll have our Rangers report. I know we talked some Astros there. We'll have a Rangers report coming up in the nine o'clock. And speaking of bullpens, I got a, a, what a crazy factoid, a stat to share with you guys about the Rangers bullpen from last year, which is mind blowing. Uh, we'll talk about the Rangers and their starts of the season the exact opposite of the uh, Astros start to the season. <laughs> they started off a little hotter than the Astros. We'll get to that. When we come back, we'll get back to hoops conversation. we got your final four that is set. Uh, the women's, uh, the Texas women's team, they are out of the NCAA tournament. We'll hear from a couple of the ladies about their disappointing loss and talk about what may be the ratings monster, the biggest uh, and most watched game of the NCAA tournament on the men or the women's side, maybe happening tonight on April Fool's Day. We'll talk about that more right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Long Horn Rod Baby's coming right back on the horn.
Welcome back to the Rodcast, a smooth soul Monday edition of the Rodcast. Uh, that's because my man Patrick Davis, the idealionaire, comes up with the musically themed days of the week. And the purpose of a smooth soul Monday is to make it a smooth transition for you into a usually a hectic work week. Uh, this work week, hopefully it's not as hectic because at least you'll have some uh, some college basketball action uh, to watch uh, uh, later on. And we have the immense Final Four that is set. Uh, you have two number one seeds uh, that did advance, UConn and Purdue. You also got your Cinderella story. You got NC State uh, also represented uh, in the on the men and the women's side uh, in their Final Four. You have uh, also uh, Alabama, a four seed that will be matched up against UConn. We'll talk about that a little bit. My man Patrick will get you your horn headlines. Tonight, there could be a game uh, that has ratings so high. Matter of fact, it may end up being the most watched game on either the men and the women's side. We'll talk about that with uh, LSU and our on the women's side meeting up again, a rematch from the national title game from last season. Uh, we'll also get into some NBA discussion. The hottest team in the NBA, uh, the Dallas Mavericks right now, have won seven straight and they end ended the streak of the the Rockets, who had the longest winning streak currently in the NBA at the time of 11 games. Uh, They faced off and they put a butt whipping on the Houston Rockets. Looks like the Mavs are trending at the right time. We'll talk about what that means for MVPs. uh, Sorry, for Lucas MVP uh, race and also for potentially uh, the Mavs to try to get one of those top four seeds in the West. We'll talk about all that and more. Uh, before we do that, uh, let me let you know about the big fat poll today. My man Patrick working hard for you. Got that up. You can go check it out the on the text line 512 447 3776. The big fat poll today, uh, bringing back the conversation to the final four. Who do you expect to win the national championship uh, on the men's side? Who's going to take home the, the championship? championship will it be um yukon are you looking at uh purdue and what they've done with zach Eady? do you believe in the cinderella story of nc state uh do you think alabama has what it takes that is the big fat poll of the day all right we'll get your horn headlines here in a second and then we'll come back we'll also hear from the uh, few of the texas women a couple of the texas women about their disappointing loss to nc state they lost 76 to 66 uh we'll come back and talk about that a little bit too before we do that let's get everybody caught up and informed that my man patrick davis uh gets you uh caught up with the horn headlines of the day all right, your Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas women's basketball season ended on Sunday with a loss to NC State 76-66. to Madison Booker led the way for the Longhorns with 17 points, but a lack of shooting in a hot Wolfpack team put a stop to the Horn season in the Elite Eight. South Carolina also punched a ticket to the Final Four, and two more teams will advance in games tonight. In the men's tournament, the Final Four is set with UConn, Alabama, Purdue, and NC State all winning over the weekend to advance. NC State will take on Purdue in a matchup, including a battle between big men Zach Eady and DJ Burns. In defending champions, UConn will take on a red-hot shooting Alabama. Both teams will have uh, both games will happen on Saturday evening. Texas baseball won their series with Kansas State two games to one, including a 21 to 11 win on Friday night. Jalen Flores had seven RBIs over the weekend, and Max Grubbs put on a solid performance on Saturday, pitching six innings with five strikeouts and only allowing one run. Texas is back in action on Tuesday facing Abilene Christian. Texas softball struggled in a weekend series against Oklahoma State, dropping the series 2-1. to one. Texas was able to pick up a hard-fought win on Friday with Sitla Lee Gutierrez only allowing one run in the outing. Uh, they will now get ready to take on the number one team in the country, Oklahoma, in Austin this upcoming weekend. MLB opening weekend came to a close with the Astros still winless, losing all four games in their opening series to the Yankees. They will try to rebound against Blue Jays uh, with the Blue Jays up next. The Rangers will pick up a pick up a series win against the Cubs. Rookie phenom Wyatt Langford had hits in all three games, and Adolis Garcia had two home runs and four RBIs to kick off his season. The Rangers will start a three-game series with the Tampa Bay Rays this afternoon, with pregame beginning at 5:15 right here on the Horn. And in the NBA, the Mavericks ended the Rockets' win streak on Sunday to take over the five seed in the Western Conference, where the Spurs lost to the Warriors, moved the Rockets to two games back from Golden State for the last spot in the playing game with eight games to go in the regular season. And that is your Horn Headlines. Uh, 
Uh, and I thank you for those horn headlines, Patrick. We appreciate it. Um, I believe it was Roger Wallace who actually got a chance to speak with a couple of the Texas women, uh, Leah Moore and then Taylor Jones, about the uh, disappointing loss they had to NC State, 76 to 66. Uh, and there was actually uh, a minor controversy as well having to do with that matchup, actually more about the uh, the location and the incompetence of the NCAA. We'll get to that story in just a second, but here is uh, audio from uh, Rod Wallace. I got it from him. Um, he's the one that actually is asking the questions here. Aaliyah Moore and Taylor Jones discussing the loss the Texas women had in the tournament to NC State. Still a slow burn what, what's happened, but this team's done a lot this year under some unusual circumstances. Yeah, um, I'm really proud of us because we have. I don't think anyone even thought we were going to be at one seed or win the Big 12 or even make it to the Elite Eight. So for us to do those things, uh, I'm extremely proud of that. It's just hard for me because uh, I wanted more really bad. Uh, I'm tired of, of just making it to the Elite Eight I because I knew this team could do it, the work that we put in. So it, it does burn really bad to be here and to see how close we were. Um, but, I mean – we talked about it in the locker room. All we can do is learn from it and go to work this summer. Yeah, I mean, the end of a season is never good. Um, it always hurts uh, when you go out this way. But Coach Schaefer said it the best. We shouldn't hang our heads. Um, we made history this year and in many different ways. And I think it's it sucks right now, but knowing that a lot of the team is going to be back next year, um, and that we're going to – I know that we'll be here again. Um, it still hurts. And I know that all of us will take this personally, and it will fuel our summer and off season and next year. Um, but I'm just really proud of this team. And no one thought that we could get to where we are today, being a one seed, winning the tournament, um, the Big 12 tournament, and just making it here. I don't really think many people – had us in the equation um, once Rory went down and I'm just really proud of everyone and like Maddie taking on the role of being a point guard and just leading our team I think it's a one for the books uh, there you go so uh, obviously ladies disappointed after losing to NC State NC State was just hot uh, there also was a like I said, minor controversy prior to the game the three-point lines apparently it was a they were disputed about the, the distance if the both uh, three-point lines were actually the same distance. After measuring the uh, three-point lines at the Moda Center, uh, they did actually find out wow. they actually weren't <laughs> the same. The uh, three-point line, three-point distances on either side of the court were different. Um, the coaches were informed about this right before tip-off. Uh, NCAA spokesman said in an email to USA Today uh, that there, quote, wasn't time to get official measurements before the game tipped, <laughs> which is also an issue. Uh, five games have been played on that floor during the tournament before the Sunday game between uh, the Longhorns and NC State. Uh, Vic Schaefer said he did. He uh, was told during warmups about the discrepancy uh, with the three-point line. Um, he did not tell the women before the game. Um, and he did not dispute when uh, NC State's head coach, Wes Moore, wanted to play the game, uh, regardless of the discrepancy. And Vic Schaefer said he did not dispute that. He did not tell his team about the three-point line. Uh, and he said it was a shame. He said um, basically it is what it is. He didn't want to draw attention to that, and he didn't want to make excuses. You know how Vic Schaefer is. So he didn't tell the ladies beforehand, and he thought unless we go to overtime – it won't be an advantage for either team, but just showing you the pure incompetence of the NCAA. That's a, that's a damn shame in the NCAA tournament. But getting back to the women, uh, Patrick, it was a valiant effort all season long. You lose Rory Harmon, your best player and your best leader, um, and still end up making it uh, that deep in the NCAA tournament. I believe three of the last four years, Vic Schaefer's made it to at least the Elite Eight, and they got the one seed. Uh, there's no telling where this team could have got to if they did have Rory Harmon. Not the case. Uh, so ladies come up a little bit short, and you heard there the frustration. Um, tired of getting to the Elite Eight. I mean, that's what Leah Moore said. I'm tired of getting to the Elite Eight. I want to get past that, <laughs> and I think that just shows you kind of the frustration, but also the determination of that group. Yeah, I mean, it's it's rough. This is, uh, you know, I feel like they've just kind of been that electric player away uh, a few years, but that's Madison Booker. We saw she still had 17 points in the game. 
Uh, but I think another year in the system, another year playing college basketball, she's going to come back better next season and could be that force in the next couple of seasons to get him over that hump. Uh, if she come, continues to grow as a player, she was really, really good this season. Uh, she could be better next season. Who else they bring in? They're still a transfer portal. Bring guys in. You're only you're losing Shaylee Gonzalez uh, and, and Deanna Gaston, I think, is all the, the only players you're technically losing uh, off this roster. Rory Harmon could be coming back next season as well. Uh, there's a lot to be hopeful for going into the next season. Uh, and if you just look at Vic Schaefer, what he did at Mississippi State, it did take him a little bit to get to the Final Four there. He made the Final Four twice at Mississippi State. Uh, it took him a little bit. Uh, I believe it was his fifth or sixth year that he ended up there. He came to Texas in 2020. So it'll be a brown that timeline for the next couple of years if he can get to the Final Four uh, with this women's team. But, yeah, I mean, if, if you keep Madison Booker growing, playing at a high level, then this team could do some real damage in the next in the coming years. Yeah, they had to expedite her maturity and development, and yeah, she turned out to be one of the best players in the country. Uh, you could just imagine how good this team would have been if they combined that with the Roy Harmon. Um, so I think that is the the hope uh, for this team going forward. But Vic Schaefer, I mean, he's one of the best coaches in the country. Damn good job there, but the women come up a little short. I can ask you this. As we're talking about women's basketball. You have tonight the matchup between Iowa and LSU. Uh, which last year in the championship game set all types of viewership records. I remember they had 9.9 million viewers for the women's championship game between LSU and Iowa last season. Uh, Just to give you perspective on that, um, that was exceeded every game, but by just it exceeded the audience of last of 2023's NBA playoffs um, every game, except the finals. Every game of last of 2023's Major League Baseball season, except for the World Series, um, every NASCAR race since 2017, <laughs> and every NHL game in more than 50 years. It got more viewers than sugar, the Sugar Orange and the Cotton Bowls from two years ago. Big 12, Pac-12, and ACC title games from a couple of years ago. Notre Dame, USC from uh, two years ago. LSU, Bama. Ohio State, Penn State, even the Texas A&M Bama game on primetime on CBS, it delayed the national title game between LSU and Iowa got better ratings. Now, we know there was a lot involved, a lot of trash talk. You know, you had star power with Kaylin Clark. You still got that. Andrew Reese, Kim Mulkey, you got recognizable names. You got villains and storylines galore. Will this game, uh, and I know it's not the championship game. Now you're talking about an Elite Eight matchup. Will it exceed or come even close to what the ratings were for that championship game last year? I don't think it'll exceed because of the, the, I think Monday night games draw less than Sunday night games. It's just, yeah. just naturally. I just, just think that, that the time slot is not. I don't know why Vince still does their NCAA tournament game on a Monday. Do it on a Sunday. You'll get way better viewership. Just you will. It's true. Uh, so I don't know why they keep doing it on Monday nights. Uh, but that I, I'll say that I, I don't think it will just solely in the fact of time slots. Uh, it, it'll be interesting. I think people are going to want to see, uh, you know, the matchup. I think Caitlin Clark is going to be that question is, can she pull off the win? Uh, I, you know, I know people are kind of spinning her in a different light now because they're giving her into the, she's gotten star treatment and now they're saying she flops too much and asks for the refs too much. And so there's that narrative going about her now. Uh, but I think for the most of the people, most of the country is going to look at LSU as the villains a lot of them because of Kim Mulkey, because that's kind of the way they paint themselves a lot of the time is as the villains. See that? Yeah. Uh, that that It kind of gives you that storyline that you can put through in the game. It, there's not a ton else on right now. I mean, you'll have baseball on, you'll have basketball on, uh, NBA basketball, MLB baseball, but I don't know if there's any key matchup that it is a game that you really, really got to tune into uh, other than this. So, I mean, I'll have it on, I'm sure. I mean, I'll probably be flipping between that and a couple other NBA games, uh, but I'll be checking in on it. Yeah, no, I think it it will it'll beat all of the sporting events tonight. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it could possibly be the highest rated game of the tournament on either side. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it'll reach the nine point nine million viewers that it had when it was the national title game. Also, because you don't have as much on the line as he lately. How, and how did the NCAA screw this up? Shouldn't they have had them in separate? brackets so they could have met in like the final four or met right 
wouldn't that have been the goal, especially think, considering yeah. what they did last season? Yeah, but you also can't completely rig it just, in a way. Just to, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, and well, I think, you can, you kind of can. You kind of can, but I think that they were trying <laughs> to. They, I think they were trying to do things in Stick the way of better, these better are the better law. teams. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, I I, it, which I mean, I get. And I, at the same point, you're trying to – I agree with what women's college basketball is trying to do as well, which is we've built a few stars. Let's try and keep building more and more stars. Like they're trying That's to right. build up Paige Eukers at, uh, at UConn as well. And uh, 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 what's the girl's name from USC? Oh, uh, Ju- uh, Juju. Juju. Which one? Juju. What, yeah. Uh, is something about? Uh, yeah, I can't. And so, that. but that's, yeah. they're trying to build more and more stars. So if you put those in, you can, you know, if you, if you just that's make it fun. about those matchup and that's the, the collision course in the finals, you kind of blow off uh, every other star. Uh, so th- that's Juju Watkins. Juju Watkins. That's it. There you go. Uh, but yeah, so they're trying to build up more stars, which you should do. I mean, college, men's college basketball should try and build up more stars. Uh, I, I feel they don't. Women's has more stars than the men do right I, now. I feel the thing in the men's game is they don't try and build them anymore because they know they're leaving. And so mm, now sure. no one really tries to build up uh, guys yeah. nationally because they just say, well, we're investing millions upon millions of dollars in advertising campaigns to try and build up this player. And then we're giving them to the NBA the next season. And we've already, we've hand delivered them a star now. And, and we're and we're them. spending all the money, <laughs> and so I think yeah. they're getting away from that. But at the end of the day, it's hurting them too because they're not building up any stars in college basketball. It's a weird, it's a weird line of being upset because you're spending money in a in a way, but then also you're right. hurting yourself. That's why it's worth to invest in a athlete that's going to at least be around for a while, for at least three yeah. years or so, so you'll know. All right, well, they'll be around. That's why I guess. You know, it's some of the other sports and even women's sports, at least, you know, the women will be around for three years if you invest in them. Yeah. Um, and I mean, football is kind of the same way. At least, you know, they'll be around for a couple. Of, well, you don't know because transfer portal. I guess you don't know a damn thing. Yeah. And then <laughs> it's, it's like you could you could technically try and build around Zach Eady, but Zach Eady isn't necessarily a guy that's so electric that people are like, oh, man, yeah. I really want to watch this guy who is seven four just dominating <laughs> and just he's just big. He's just big. <laughs> He's just big, man. Yeah, he is. He, he is no doubt about that. Speaking of, let's get to that because um, right now we do have the Final Four set for the men on the men's side, and it looks like UConn right now, I mean, they are – I haven't looked at the Vegas odds, but I imagine they are a heavy favorite uh, to win the tournament right now. You do have your Cinderella story in North Carolina State, but UConn will face Alabama in the Final Four. Uh, Purdue will face North Carolina State. I did see the stat that the NC State, it's how hot they are. They are the first team to beat Duke in the tournament. Sorry, in the AC in a conference tournament, and then beat them in the in the big dance uh, in the NCAA tournament. That Duke's never had that happen to them before. Uh, lost to a team in the conference tournament and then lose to them in the NCAA tournament. That's, but it's tough to do that. I think to beat a a program like Duke twice like that in the postseason, and in, that's how hot NC State is right now, man. They are. There's no doubt. As a Cinderella, they they fit they fit the bill. They fit the bill. Yeah, they're they're definitely uh it, it, they're they're a lot of fun to watch. It, it is DJ Burns is just a fun guy to see go out there and play the game. Uh it's funny his post game interview uh yesterday after the game was basically, you know, why are you guys playing better? Well, you know, we're you know, we're all showing up now. He was like, No one's late anymore, and you know, we're working hard, and you're like, Were you not doing that all season? Apparently not. I think that you should have been doing that all season. <laughs> hey, I'm glad they're doing it. Now they're, they're they're getting hot at the right time. You know the yeah. coaches hear that and be like, "Yeah, guys, I've been telling you, you just show up on time. Things show up on time. <laughs> That's half the battle, guys. Half the damn battle. That's good. That's a good point there. But uh, yeah, they whatever they're doing, it's working. Um, and you're right about Purdue. Or you talked about it earlier about Zach Eady. The question is does does a team, any of the teams left that they can still play, um, whether that be NC State, and you're right, they got a matchup there with another big man that may be an answer for Zach Eady. But even if Purdue advances, whoever they play, nobody's had an answer for him quite yet. Yeah. And he's been dominant. He's actually, uh, if you go look at it, he's the seventh player with 40-plus points and 15 rebounds in a tournament game. Uh, and he's the first player since 1990 to do it. Uh, he had a, he's got a hundred plus points and sixty plus rebounds before getting to the final four. Um, he's in the same uh, realm now with Blake Griffin, who did that, and Elvin Hayes, who did it in nineteen sixty eight. 
he nobody can nobody can really find a way to neutralize him. He's just so big and so dominant once he gets down low, and once he gets there, it's already too late. Once he's yeah. down low, it's too late. And that's you know, it, with most big guys, that's gonna be an issue. But you know, in today's game, when you have a big guy like that that is getting underneath the basket, has enough post moves, has enough ball control, you know, that's one of the problems you have with some of these guys is they get to inside, but then they dribble too many times, ball gets poked away, you can double team off of them. Purdue's also got shooting outside that you can't, it's harder and harder to double inside on him, but he's just been able to get inside, put his arm down to be able to get fouled, try and go in there and just push towards the basket. And even if he's not getting the shot in, he's getting free throws. Uh, I mean, he shot more free throws than I believe uh, his opponents did last game as well, like the entire team. So, uh, you know, if he's getting inside, but that's been a problem with Purdue in previous years is he will get calls up until that sweet 16 elite eight and refs start to call it a little differently, start to let him play a little bit more. He gets frustrated. He gets beat up. He goes on the other end and then he commits fouls on the other end because he's frustrated uh, because they're bumping him so hard. And then he comes over on somebody else and is moving into the screen or if he's moving into a, uh, a block or something like that. And those fouls look really bad because there's a giant doing it to you. And so <laughs> and it's a difference of how they're calling the game is if you look at it and say on one side, you have a bunch of smaller guys trying to bump with, uh, with a giant or a giant bumping with you. And so sometimes it, 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 it wait, you know, What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Sometimes it bites him that he is getting all these calls, but eventually in the tournaments in past years, when that disappears, it may go the other way against him. And that'll be interesting to see how they go against NC State because DJ Burns is going to be on him some because you know that they'll be able to bounce bodies. And Burns is a is a big man. Uh, he's, he's only 6'9", but he is wider than Zach Eady is. So he'll be able to, if he gets down the court, those two guys will be trying to race down for position a lot on the defensive end for, for NC State. It'll be a fun matchup to watch and see how it's officiated. Uh, and I think the NCAA is going to put officials on that will let them play a little bit more on both ends uh, and yeah. not try and get either one of these guys in foul trouble because they know what the fans want to see, and they want to see this game get played out between these two guys. Oh, yeah, it'd be fun. Uh, to watch two big men kind of go at it uh, whenever whenever they're matched up against one another. So that's really that that could be an interesting game just because of that matchup alone. But the UConn Bama matchup, um, I mean, I haven't looked at the line on that game, but I, I imagine UConn's a pretty heavy favorite because they have looked dominant so far, and they're, they're kind of taking all the drama out of <laughs> the NCAA tournament. Even your big fat poll today was who you think is going to win the NCAA tournament. I haven't looked at the text line, 512-447-3776, but I imagine a lot of people are heavy on UConn to win because they've just looked they looked that good. Yeah, there's there's a little tested. bit of confidence in UConn right now. <laughs> so they, they have not really looked like they've had to try too hard in these games. Yeah. Uh, so you, UConn is a 11 and a half point favorite in ooh, a final four damn, game in the final four. Yeah, and I was say, Purdue is an eight final. and a half point favorite. Oh, wow. So oh, both yeah, well, that's Cinderella. So heavily yeah. favored, uh, in their matchups. That might be some money to be made there though. If, uh, especially in the North Carolina state Purdue one, I don't know about the UConn Alabama. They can keep it there. That's like 11. That's the 11 is a big number. So I gotta go look at the history of final fours and see how often teams win by, Double digit margins or how often yeah. they're really close. I mean, the, the question right. is if Alabama can keep shooting threes, if Alabama keeps shooting the ball really well, then they they, then they're 11. in the game for sure because that's how yeah. they're in all these games is they just start shooting the ball really hot and they can go on a 21 5 run in no time because they're just hitting threes and the other team you get a mid rebound right back down three more points. And yeah. that's what Alabama can do. So, you, you know, it, it, there's a chance that they can come in there and at least give a scare to UConn, if not give them a, a beat them. Yeah, I feel like that 11 is a big number. It I'll is. just see what – tomorrow we'll talk about what Vegas has to say about that big number. I'll do some research on that. That's good stuff. Uh, all right, uh, thank you, Patrick, for the breakdown. Now, I wanted to get some NBA discussion, which we will. We'll come back to some NBA talk, uh, but we got to get to uh, our Texas football conversation, go behind the burners card, talk about some Texas spring practice news, notes, and nuggets. We'll get you caught up with all of the, uh, the goings-on behind the burners card when we come back right here. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm like, Tom Longhorn, Rod Baber is coming right back on the horn.
Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Nobody likes traffic, uh, especially if you're sitting in traffic in a car that you don't really enjoy. What if you're in a car that's a little bit too run down or it's old, it, don't, it no longer fits your lifestyle? Uh, maybe you need a bigger car. Maybe you need to downsize uh, and get something a little bit smaller. Maybe your, your automobile right now is just, uh, you know, at this point, it's just a, a bad deal for you, right? Maybe you're in a bad lease and you're not getting the value that you would want from that automobile. Either way, uh, you need to reach out to my friends over at Apple leasing. No matter what the reason for you getting a new car, uh, my friends at Apple Leasing can make sure you get the price you want, the payment you want on the car that you want. They have the ability to put you in any make or model of vehicle that you want. The professionals over at Apple Leasing can, uh, like I said, help you get the price you want, the payment you want on the car you want. Now, it's a pretty simple business model, um, but it's a simplistically brilliant one, and they can help you uh, right now navigate uh, the auto uh, industry and help you navigate that process. Uh, they can help you vet the dealers. Uh, they will vet the dealers for you. They will vet uh, the automakers for you. They'll do all the research about the vehicle to find out how safe it is. Uh, they'll also uh, make sure that uh, they can get you the right price point. Whatever your budget is, they'll find the right car for your budget and for your lifestyle. And that's the beauty of what Apple Leasing does. They, they want to simplify the process for you. They know that you know getting a new car can be really time consuming. It can be really stressful uh, doing all those things, going to different dealerships, going down the rabbit hole, researching uh, the different cars, uh, making sure that it fits your budget and your lifestyle. My friends at Apple Leasing, they'll do all that for you. They'll do all the legwork for you. All you got to do is give them the specifications. Let them know what kind of car you want, a, a, a truck or a sedan or an SUV. You let them know exactly what color you want. You let them know all of your of the different details and let them know exactly what your budget is, and they'll do all the rest. They have what they call a simple interest, easy lease that makes things well simple and easy for you. It's going to give you a lot of flexibility, which is going to give you more possibilities and options to help you find the vehicle that fits you best, but more importantly, the vehicle that fits your budget best. So give them a call today, 512-346-9977. That's 512-346-9977. Or visit AppleLeasing.com. That's AppleLeasing.com. All right, time to uh, get into some uh, Texas spring football discussion here. Uh, shout out to my friends over at On Texas Football doing a great job. Got some of these note these notes uh, from them last night. Uh, and apparently, the uh, Longhorns will be getting ready for their seventh overall practice uh, coming up on Tuesday. Uh, they've had four padded practices, so full pads for four practices. And as I pointed out, you know, earlier in the show, this is when you start to see separation. Um, you know, earlier on when guys are just in shorts and helmets and then they're in underwear, as Sark calls them, with just their shoulder pads and helmets and, you know, no uh, no, no other pads on. You know, there's a, there's a finesse element to practice, and a lot of guys can look really good when it's just strictly a finesse um, game, right? It's all it's all about finesse. Nobody's hitting anybody. Uh, nobody's get you no know, getting tackled to the ground. Um, there's no real physicality element at practice, and that's a lot of what the the media got to see. But now you're getting to where they are. 
they're you know they're banging it, they're banging a ton at practice. Uh, you're talking about lots of padded practices, and now you're going to get the sample size where guys can separate because once you get past that finesse element, you add the physicality. You know, not everybody's game translates once you add that physicality element to it, um, once you put all the pads on. And then some guys, they start to look a little bit different. And like I said, they start to uh, elevate. And from what I'm hearing, um, based on our friends at On Texas Football, shout out to Jerry Hamilton. Cedric Baxter is one of those guys that already looks like he is starting to elevate and separate the more padded practices they have. And that's what you want to see. As it, as it gets more and more physical, some of these athletes, they should start to separate from other guys. And that's what you're getting from Cedric Baxter. So apparently he looked really, really good. He has not necessarily added a lot of weight. Um, he, I think he has just transformed his body and now he is more rocked up. He's more muscular. So I think you just took the mass and turned it, uh, transformed it more into muscle. Uh, but either way, his vision was always great. But now Cedric Baxter looks like he could be that, that physical presence you want in between the tackles uh, as a runner. And you combine that with a guy like Jaden Blue and in the speed element on the outside. That's a really good sign. And I think part of that is the way the reason he looks so good is the offensive line probably looks really good too. This is probably one of your more physical run blocking old lines you've had in a really long time in Texas. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's going to be that. But we know that last season he, uh, he had issues staying on the field sometimes, get banged up, come off the field. Uh, it was, wasn't able to sustain drives for himself. Uh, so we knew he needed to go work on that during the offseason. It yep. sounds like he does, but that's the kind of stuff you want to hear out of spring training is this was an issue last season. It seems to have been addressed uh, in the offseason, and he's going to be coming in a little bit more ready. And we've seen with the young guys coming in behind him, he understands he was a freshman last year, and you know he, he got the starting job, and he lost it, and he came back yep. and was going back and forth. I think he knows at Texas – there is no sure thing. He's got to go out there and provide uh, that provide Coach Shark a reason to leave him in these games. And if you're going to be coming off the field a lot, you're opening the door for somebody else to come in and get those reps. That's what Jonathan Brooks took advantage of. That uh, we know Jared Gibson and Christian Clark are going to be right behind him. Uh, you know, there's going to be a number of guys in that running back room ready to go. So it's glad it's good to see that he is coming out ready to be the guy that he needs to be for Texas. Yeah, um, I was uh, talking to Jerry yesterday, and Jerry Hamilton believes that might be the most talented position room in on the team. Yeah, I like guess the most talented position room from top to bottom. Uh, I think my man Bobby Burden disputed that. He said he thinks it's quarterback because he thinks, well, hard to argue with that. Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning and then Trey Owens, who, by the way, is getting rave reviews. Yeah. At uh, spring practice. And I said I said that when I, I saw him for the first time, man, Trey Owens can slang it. And this was before he won Offensive Player of the Year in Houston. He can slang it. He's a little clunky at times, athletically. I just think that's because he just doesn't have his grown man body yet. He's still kind of got the teenage body working. But I think once he matures into that frame, because he's huge, once he matures into that frame, <laughs> he's he's got a gun that can make all the throws. And he's so confident in his arm that he never really puts a lot of velocity on the football. I asked him about that. I said, have you ever just let it loose? on a throw and he basically said no like i never really have to like i can put enough touch on the ball i can put enough velo on the ball to get it there and he that his touch is amazing so he that I, honestly he, he's got an nfl skill set he does he's just behind orange manning who's behind quinn ewers i just don't know when he's gonna see the field but apparently he looks really good out there slanging the rock in spring yeah not surprised and he's he's really he's borderline cocky and arrogant too he's confident Got a lot of swagger, borderline cocky and arrogant, which, by the way, I, I kind of like for my quarterbacks. I don't mind that at all. Yeah. I don't mind that at all. I, I need him to have a lot of swagger. He's got plenty. Of, and if you're going to sit behind Arch Manning, who's behind Quinn Ewers, and you want him to stick long enough to be patient and battle for that spot, you're going to need a guy with that kind of swagger who's like, no, no, I can play. Yeah. You, know, I can, you I that can Malik be. Murphy confidence. I'll come back. Yes. Don't worry. Yes. I'll come back. Yes. I'll hey, Look, I'll, until you tell me that I am third string and that I can't compete for that starting job, I'll yep. keep coming back because I think I can go out there and play. And that we saw him stay another year. You want to see how Trey Owens good? No, I get Archer's going to be here, but I'll be right behind him. And you know how many quarterbacks finish this season across the NFL, across the college football, much less at the, in UT. 
Yeah, um, I, since 1999, Texas has had a quarterback start and finish every game. I believe it's happened only seven times since 1999. I could be like one or season one or two seasons off. That. I think it's seven times, though, total. Yeah. Where somebody has started, started and finished every game at the quarterback position since 1999. So it ain't likely. And we hope Quinn does it because NFL scouts want to see it because he hasn't finished a complete season without getting hurt since his sophomore year of high school. That, that needs to change this upcoming yeah. season. But if it doesn't, Texas definitely has the quarterback depth there. Uh, let's talk about a couple of players who are rising fast, climbing the depth chart in during spring, as we reported by multiple uh, sites how well they're doing. Uh, first of all, DeAndre Moore is really, uh, I think, he is really going to force Sark to expand his wide receiver rotation. Uh, the, the, the report is that he's going to see the field. And that he's going to be getting, I'm talking about big time reps. I'm, he's not going to be your first or second leading receiver, but he's definitely going to be battling to be your third leading receiver in that conversation. So if he's going to see the field along with Jante Cook and along with Silas, uh, 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 Silas Bowden um, and Isaiah Bond, which we all assume now, now Silas Bowden is not even on campus yet. So maybe I shouldn't put him in the category just yet. So maybe we'll just go with Isaiah Bond, Jonte Cook, DeAndre Moore, who's turning heads in practice. Yeah. He's, he looks the part and looks like he's going to, he's going to be able to penetrate that rotation of wide receivers. And then you throw in a Matthew Golden, who also looks really good. That's four. I think Silas Bowden will get some, some some run in that rotation too. That would be five. But even if he doesn't, let's say it's Ryan Wingo that gets sprinkled in as that prodigy is the the five star receiver thrown in there. Either way, I think for the first time since Sark has been here, he expands his wide receiver rotation at Circle of Trust. I think you get I think you get five in there. I think that's the as I think you get five to start, and you may get six depending on if Silas Bowden really turns out to be an impact play. Yeah, and I mean Sark's mentioned it already. The the concept that you're gonna have to play more games because of a playoffs now that this could extend your season. Uh, you know, you're going to the SEC where there's gonna be guys that are taking, you know, they're playing a physical style of football. Uh, I think he's going to definitely have to use a number of guys early on and figure out but by the time you get to the playoffs it could whittle down to four three or four guys that are really the guys who are going to get your majority of uh snaps but early on yeah it could go five six guys pretty easily that are going to get in there and rotate in and out and see who sticks see who makes it so you know basically show me who i can't take out of the game exactly I agree. Who makes the most plays? Yeah. It, it, pretty much you can earn it. Yeah. Who makes and, and, and who who makes mental errors and mistakes who therefore I think end up moving out or being moved out of the circle of trust because Sark can't trust them. Yeah. Make, and the right and then a guy like DeAndre Moore, that Jay Witt role, if you can fall into that role of who's somebody that even if if even if you're not a target, you're still super valuable to me on the field every single play. I can't pull you out because your value is more than just a receiver. Your value is a blocker. Your value is, uh, you know, you know, being able to run a crossing route and maybe, maybe bump a DB on the other side. Just different categories of things that you might be able to do. That factor, just anything to make sure I can't take you off the field. Who earns that? Yeah, because uh, Jay Witt was their best blocking wide receiver. We don't know that to this like th- with this group. Who's going to be the best blocking wide receiver? Remember when they first put Ad Mitchell out there? He didn't want to block. I mean, it was pretty obvious he didn't want to block. He didn't put any effort in blocking, and he didn't have any pride in it toward the end of the season. Yeah. He got better because I think he saw it on film, and I think Chris Jackson, the wide receiver coach who's from the NFL, told him, dude, NFL scouts are watching this, and they are they are disgusted by your effort. Like, you, can, you can be bad at it. You can be – execution is different than effort. Your effort is terrible. Your execution can be bad. That just means like, oh, man, bad fundamentals, bad technique, his eyes in the wrong place, whatever. But your effort – I mean, effort can be piss poor like that. Yeah. And I think that's pro- – and that's when we saw him with more effort. And, by the way, more effort, his execution was better. Just naturally having more pride in his blocking, it improved the blocking. So that's another thing about uh, this group of wide receivers. We don't know – remember with Jay Witt, Sark would put him in there just to block for those screen passes. He would put yeah. him in there in 12 personnel and sometimes with uh, pony packages because he knew we're going to run the football and he's my best blocker on the outside. Mm-hmm. We don't necessarily know that about this group, so great point there. Uh, another guy rising up some of the uh, the depth charts here in spring, Jalen Gilbo. Hearing a lot of really good things about Jalen Gilbo, 
And Inside Texas reported that Gilbo um, is looking really, really good as one of those guys inside. Now, that is important because if Jalen Gilbo looks good at that nickel spot and can stabilize it, you got Jaday Barron. He's your starting nickel. But Jaday Barron wants to play corner. They're cross-training him at corner and nickel and safety. So they're going to cross-train him, and he wants to play corner in the future. And matchup-wise and uh, situation that you want to move him out there, you need somebody you can trust playing the nickel spot. Now, Makuba can play it, but Makuba's playing safety right now. I think they like him there because they rotate their safeties a lot. So if Gilbo ends up being the guy that can stabilize the nickel, then you got a lot of freedom and flexibility with Jaday Barron. Uh, to, to to promote that versatility with his game. So that's big. Yeah. That Jalen Gibble's there. It'll be big, uh, that secondary room. You just want competition everywhere. And to hear guys' names that you don't necessarily think of as the top guys, like a Jalen Gilbo, mm-hmm. to hear that he is entering in that conversation, like you yeah. can speak to when when Texas was DBU and when you had, a guy, when you had guys going in, that there was competition always. And to have a great DB room, you need to have competition that everybody knows every day of practice is important. Same concept that we just talked about wide receiver. Give me, yep. make yourself a way that you can't, you can't be taken off. Show me why you have to be on the field play after play. You want to see more of that than, well, I guess we have to leave you on because we don't have anybody else. And it felt like that at points in the last couple of seasons. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that's a really, I, I totally agree with that. Um, and the last little nugget here, NATO Umeo Zulu, uh, on the offensive line. Shout out to my man CJ Vogel over there at On Texas Football Reporting. He has been taking uh the most reps with the first team offensive line at that left guard position, the the only real open position uh on that offensive line. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about whether it be uh, you know, uh, Cole Hudson or whether it be Hayden Connor. Uh, it seems like NATO might be right now separating and elevating. Now that we're putting the pads on, he may be the one that's separating and elevating among that group. Um, so you might have your best five, or at least your starting five on that O-line with Kelvin Banks at left uh, tackle. NATO now at the left guard, center Jake Majors, right guard DJ Campbell and the right tackle Cam Williams. That is a monster gargantuan offensive line that could be an a plus run blocking old line all right going into the sec all right we come back we'll get into off the record uh what the hell is going on with rasheed rice we'll talk about that story a little bit and one of the most bizarre stories that brings up way more questions uh than answers we'll talk about that on the other side and off the record right here on the broadcast featuring patrick davis on lifetime longhorn rod babers coming back on the horn
All right, welcome back to the broadcast. Uh, it's time to get into off the record here. A couple of stories that I want to get into. The first one being this Rasheed Rice story. Um, and I believe now we do have, I was waiting to see if there was an update on the story. And we do have one. Pro Football Talk is saying that Rasheed Rice, according to Josina Anderson of CBSSports.com, that he has retained counsel finally, in the aftermath of a car crash, a hit and run allegedly involving him. Um, and the car at least was registered to him. That's why people jumped to the conclusion that it was him. Um, police believe the vehicle was racing another car before the six car collision. Um, whoever was driving the vehicle registered to Rasheed Rice left the scene of the accident. By the way, TMZ has published pictures and video of men leaving the scene. Um, now, whether they have been identified by the authorities as Rasheed Rice, that's a different discussion. But there are guys that are leaving the scene, um, allegedly, of that accident. TMZ, TMZ has posted those photos. A video of the men walking away from the crash also surfaced. Even if Rice was in the group, the key question is whether he was behind the wheel, because we don't know that. Uh, the relevant Texas law speaks in terms of the operator of the car, not passengers or owners of the vehicle. So if he is in that video or the photos, allegedly, of him fleeing the scene, that would be evidence of him fleeing the scene. But I guess he still could uh, say or claim that he wasn't driving the automobile at the time. And because so much time has expired from the time of the accident and he did flee the scene, there's no police report. If someone was intoxicated behind the wheel, that also cannot, cannot be proven, um, even though you still got to deal with the fleeing the scene stuff. So we don't know if there was alcohol or involved or someone was intoxicated or inebriated behind the wheel. And we actually don't know if it's Rasheed Rice was driving. The car was one of the cars were registered to him and he has finally retained counsel. So I'm assuming we'll get. Uh, some type of clarity on this story, Patrick, but really bizarre. I don't know why he was racing. Uh, apparently a woman uh, was injured in, the, in, one of the, in, in one of the automobiles too. Um, she said that the men put her four-year-old son in danger, uh, but nobody was hurt seriously, I believe. This woman also claims that she said a pair of uh, there's there's some cleats left in the back of the Lamborghini, <laughs> uh, one of the cars uh, that she says. And one of the witnesses said that they thought they took some stuff out of the trunk of the car, like stuff out of the car with them, not just themselves. They took some stuff out of the car. And police say that it was a Corvette and a Lamborghini that were racing. Yeah, and, and that's I, I haven't been able to keep I did. There's too many things in this that I see one story and it's not substantiated. And then you see another part. And then there's there's guns in the car, and then there was there was drugs yeah, in the was car, and then there yeah. was drinking, and then they were, and then Rasheed Rice was not there, and he's not one of the men pictured, and then Rasheed Rice was driving, and so I everything I've seen, I have no idea what the actual truth of it is right now because you just keep seeing everybody going out, and then the internet is yeah. what it is, so people are putting out their own uh, theories or whatever to get clicks. So who knows what actually has happened? Uh, hopefully he will make a statement today. I, I had seen some stuff similar to that, that he was going to get counsel and then make a statement, whether he says uh, they did not have permission to take my car or they took my car and I had no idea what they were going to do with it. And so they, I, it's not me. Uh you need but, a fall guy like Shohei. You better pay big yeah, money. I did. I did see <laughs> that joke was that joke was big too. That apparently the car was driven by R Rasheed Rice's translator. That was a <laughs> was a that was Seriously, a popular joke online. Man, they got, that's good stuff. Yeah, that is a good joke. That's pretty good. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here. He said that statement he makes. That's going to be interesting because uh, there's a lot to clear up here um, about what what all went down. And uh, yeah, so that's that was a big story from this weekend. And I think for Rasheed Rice, either way, this is not going to end up good for him. He's probably got a suspension of some kind, potentially facing here I, now unless they just stole his car now maybe it's like they stole his car he had nothing to do with it now that could be the case but i don't know if that's going to be the case yeah i mean even if uh, even if he let them borrow the car i don't know if the nfl is going to suspend him for letting them borrow the car oh know. yeah i'm talking about if he was there basically yeah, yeah. yeah if he, if, if he if walked he away from the scene or if they yes or if they you know obviously can't prove that he was in anybody was intoxicated having to do with the accident whatever if he was there at the scene at any time i do think he's gonna get some type of suspension yeah no matter what the legalities are yeah yeah you but can't right, he wasn't there if he wasn't there he's fine he's like hey man they stole my car or i took i lent them the keys great if he's not there he's fine if he's there 
he'll have yeah he'll do he'll the price he'll do the show hey and uh they stole from me well you gonna press charges nah 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 that's they're hard. just uh, <laughs> they just at risk youth they just uh <laughs> you know joy riding around uh yeah i don't know how that's gonna play out like i said if he's there trouble if not then i think he can find some way to uh uh, walk through the raindrops there. All right, that's the Rasheed Rice story. There's another story I wanted to get to, but if we have time, we'll get into it. If not, uh, it's 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 evergreen. All right, we can get into it tomorrow. It's a little bizarre, but uh, we ran out of time here and off the record. There you go, Rasheed Rice uh, with a lot of questions to answer about the uh, the accident over the weekend involving a car in his name. Don't know if he was involved yet, though. All right, we come back. We'll get into some NFL discussion. Texans are an it team in the NFL. What the hell are the Cowboys going to do at running back? We also got a Rangers report coming up for you. Rangers starting their season a uh, whole lot different than the Astros are starting theirs. We'll talk about that on the other side, too, right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. I uh, came back home here to Austin to see that uh, my the weed feed that I put down for my friends over at Callahan's had uh, made the yard look even better. Killed all the weeds. Now I got new growth growing. Uh, you can kind of see some of the fresh green grass growing in the yard there. Uh, so I did the pre-emergence first, then got the weed feed down. Uh, next stage for me, get over to Callahan's. I got to get uh, some more Bermuda seeds, kind of fill in the patches of grass after the, the weeds died. I thought that was grass. Turns out it was weeds. That's okay. All right, the weeds are dead. We're going to fill in that with some Bermuda seed for my friends over at Callahan's and get the yard looking like it's a, it's, it's a golf course ready. I want the best lawn in the neighborhood or at least one of the best yards in the neighborhood. My friends at Callahan's General Store are going to help me accomplish that. Uh, every time we have a man, Charlie Wilson, on, I ask him. He is the CEO, uh, General Manager of Callahan's. I'm asking him, hey, what can I do to make sure that I have my lawn golf course ready? I want it looking healthy, plush, and green. And uh, the best advice he gives me is to get on over to Callahan's General Store. It's just that simple. Callahan's General Store has got everything you need to make sure that your lawn is looking top notch. They got the pre-emergence there, such as a barricade uh, product from Nitro Foss. They got the weed and feed there as well. And they also have the Bermuda seed, as I told you, to make sure you can fill in all the gaps uh, where you had damage from, I don't know, too much sun and maybe somewhere, maybe a sun damage or maybe from the winter freezes. Uh, there's a little cold damage, whatever it may be. Callahan's got everything you need. They got bags of soil. They got the amendments, the special fertilizers to get your lawn back into a beautifully lush and healthy looking yard. Even if you're you got the green thumb and you're already starting to plant your vegetables. Uh, maybe you're thinking about planting new trees so that uh, you can enjoy them for generations to come. Callahan's can take care of you there as well. Uh, they are all the seedling vegetables for your gardens, a uh, weekly variety of peppers and tomatoes and melons and other plants to choose from. Also, time to plant those trees we talked about, the pecan trees and the fruit trees. They have those at Callahan's General Store as well. And, you know, we just uh, got done with Easter. So our friends over at Callahan's General Store, uh, they celebrate Easter. Easter. It was a really fun. Had uh, all the uh, the little chickling, uh, the little chicks out, baby chicks and ducklings and rabbits out there. Uh, but even going forward, uh, now that we're done with Easter, if you do need uh, feed for your animals, small and large, they have that at Callahan's as well. So whatever you need, they got there at Callahan's. Remember where it is? Still there at 501 Bastrop Highway between downtown and airport. Uh, every day is a great day to make it a Callahan's day.
about to go in there. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Welcome back to the Rodcast. It is a Smooth Soul Monday edition of the Rodcast. That's uh, the idillionaire Patrick Davis comes up with the musically themed days of the week. And a Smooth Soul Monday is intended to uh, make a smooth transition for all of you into a heavy, hectic work week. So we appreciate my man Patrick and all of his efforts for a Smooth Soul Monday. Uh, we'll get to a Rangers report coming up here at the end of this segment. We're going to cram in a Rod rant of the day. We got some Texans talk that I want to get to to start off. There is horn headlines we got to get to. Oh, there's a lot coming up in this segment. All right, we'll try to cram as much of it in to this segment as we can. Uh, next segment, I do want to talk NBA if we get a chance to. I want to get into some NBA discussion. Uh, I think uh, Luca may be helping his uh, his MVP case uh, with some of his performances lately. We'll get into that coming up, uh, and also, uh, like I said, we'll talk. Uh, Raj Rant. We'll talk Cowboys there. So I know we'll talk Texans, but we'll get into the Cowboys and their running back situation in Raj Rant. Let's not waste any time. Let's get uh, my man uh, Patrick to hit us up with the horn headlines uh, here, and then we'll get into our uh, we'll get into Texans. We'll talk Cowboys and Raj Rant, and we'll get our range report. We're gonna hit them up. Uh, let's hit the horn headlines really quickly with Patrick Davis. All right, your Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas women's basketball season ended on Sunday with a loss to NC State, 76-66. to Madison Booker led the way for the Longhorns with 17 points, but a lack of shooting and a hot Wolfpack team put a stop to the Horn season in the Elite Eight. South Carolina also punched a ticket to the Final Four with two more teams advancing game from games tonight. In the men's tournament, the Final Four is set with UConn, Alabama, Purdue, and NC State all winning over the weekend to advance. NC State will take on Purdue in a matchup including a battle between big men Zach Eady and DJ Burns. And UConn will take on a red-hot shooting Alabama. Both games will happen on Saturday evening. Texas baseball won their series with Kansas State two games to one, including a 21-11 win on Friday night. Jalen Flores had seven RBIs over the weekend, and Max Grubbs put on a solid performance on Saturday, pitching six innings with five strikeouts and only allowing one run. Texas is back in action on Tuesday, facing Abilene Christian. Texas softball struggled in a weekend series against Oklahoma State, dropping the series 2-1. to one. Texas was able to pick up a hard-fought win on Friday with Sitla Lee Gutierrez only allowing one run in the outing. They will now get ready to take on the number one team in the country, Oklahoma, in Austin this upcoming weekend. MLB opening weekend came to a close with the Astros still winless, losing all four games in their opening series to the Yankees. They will try to rebound against the Blue Jays up next, and the Rangers pick up a series win against the Cubs. Rookie phenom Wyatt Langford has hit in all three games, and Adolis Garcia's had two home runs and four RBIs to kick off his season. The Rangers start a three-game series with the Tampa Bay Rays this afternoon, with pregame beginning at 5.15 right here on the Horn. And in the NBA, the Mavericks ended the Rockets' win streak on Sunday to take over the five seed in the Western Conference, where the Spurs lost to the Warriors, moved the Rockets to two games back from Golden State for the last spot in the play-in with eight games left to go in the season. And that is your Horn Headlines. I thank you, Patrick, for the horn headlines. Uh, we appreciate that. All right, let's get first. Let's get to this Texans uh, conversation. Um, and Patrick, could you have that Saquon Barkley sound ready to go? He went uh, on a podcast, actually the Kelsey Brothers podcast, and he was talking about his free agency experience. And uh, he actually confirmed some of the reports and rumors <clears throat> that were out there about Saquon and what team he was interested in uh, and what teams were interested in him doing free agency. And one of them piqued my interest. Here is Saquon Barkley on that Kelsey uh, Brothers podcast um, where he talks about his free agency experience overall. You did that. There were, there, there were rumors eventually or in the beginning that the Eagles were kind of in it. Were they always kind of like the top choice or they, were they the ones kind of trying to make that move happen or let's be, I'm going to be honest here. Right. This is what, this is what the show is for. Really? I mean, probably the first team that had like my first interest was Houston. 
Ooh, Ooh, it was Houston. That would have been, um, been was, dangerous too. Was really, uh, I got to communicate uh, with CJ and a couple of those boys. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. Uh, but this is before like all the, you know, when you actually put offers on the table and talk to teams. And um, then as it got closer and you start hearing word and it's like, okay, like, you know, Philly, I, I probably never imagined myself playing for Philly, you know, six years ago. Yeah, uh, sure. But it was like, I get to, come back to Pennsylvania. My family's from Pennsylvania. My lady, our kids, like grandmas, all that's from um, Pennsylvania. So we get to, we're already close. We even get to get closer. Uh, There you go. That's Saquon Barkley. Confirming the reports, uh, you know, earlier prior to NFL free agency um, starting officially that there was mutual interest between the Texans and uh, Saquon Barkley. It seems like the interest was on a player level. He's talking to CJ Stroud, which I'm sure can pass along um, the message to Nick Casario and the front office for the Texans. Um, and we know they'll listen because hell, they listened to him when they drafted Tank Dale. That was a recommendation by C.J. Stroud. But I think the more important factor here is, Patrick, is that C.J. Stroud is actively recruiting for the Texans. He, when there is a free agent out there like Saquon Barkley, and maybe it's selfishly because he wants to get on offense and he plays offense, but he's recruiting for the Texans. He's reaching out to free agents. That's important. I mean, that that is something. And, and obviously, the Texans are changing their perception of the entire franchise the organization. Um, but CJ Stroud is the face of that franchise. And when, you know, it means something a little bit different when CJ Stroud is reaching out to these players. I um, mean, by the way, players can't tamper, so it is better anyway. But I think it's it's uh, a far different, you know, uh, culture than when a guy like Deshaun Watson was there. Nothing against Deshaun Watson either. Um, but now the, it seems like the, the perception of the Texans is matching up with the actual culture of the Texans. And the face of the franchise looks like he is going to be a guy that not only can, on the field can back it up, but even off the field, he's going to be representing that Texans brand too. In a, yeah. lot, in a lot of different ways. No, and that's what you want to see is you want to be able to see a guy who has the the interest, who understands all those pieces. The fact that he clearly has relationships building with guys around the league that, you know, maybe yeah. this isn't the offseason you bring him in. Maybe it's not the time you do it. However, if you can go ahead and start that relationship and then two seasons down the road, you need a wide receiver and C.J. Stroud's already talking to them. Or, you know, whenever you're looking down the road, or you need an offensive lineman, and C.J. Stroud knows this this left guard, that'll be perfect for you. Uh, whether it's running backs, wide receivers, whether it's guys on the defensive end that he may know. Uh, whatever it is, to be able to continue to be that piece when you, you know, when we have legal tampering, but before that, players can tamper as well, because uh, it's not tampering if it's a player. Uh, that's something that'll be big for the Texans. They try and build in this window where CJ Stroud's still in that rookie contract. Exactly. When you got the money to spend and you know, they want to play for championships. They want to compete for championships. You'll get some of those guys and you'll get some guys that wouldn't give Texans a bit of a discount. We know they like yeah. homegrown talent. They've talked about how openly they want players who play high school football and college football in the state of Texas. Daniel Hunter was one of those guys who they signed uh, in free agency. And I don't know if he admitted it, but the report from pro football talk is that the Colts m- offered him more money. Uh, he decided to stay with the, the, to take the Texans offer. It is a hometown discount because he's from that area. Uh, but also I think part of it is the Texans are just a more attractive option and landing uh, spot for free agents than they used to be because of CJ Stroud, because of D'Amico Ryan. Um, I think a lot of things now are going to lead to Texans being able to capitalize more on that, this new image, um, the new kind of brand perception that they have for the Texans now. Where we before, I don't think the Texans even had that ability to do that. I'm trying to think the last time the Texans were cool enough to attract free agents, top free agents, where they wanted to play for the Texans. Have they Texans been cool like that before? Maybe Deshaun Watson at that 20, maybe right before 2020, or is it 2019? He had that big year. I'm trying to think of the big year he had. Yeah, that maybe. Uh, but then Bill O'Brien was an a hole, and nobody wanted to play with Bill O'Brien. Yeah, and they had all the play for him. and yeah, then they had that front office. You know, it was, you know, Bill O'Brien forced out Rick Smith when he was dealing with his wife's cancer. And there was that whole world. Oh, yeah. No, it's, yeah, I don't know if they've ever been that. Yeah, because I think there's guys that maybe were like, oh, I could play with Deshaun Watson. That could be a thing. But then the rest of the program wasn't at a level where people really wanted to go be a part of it. Where now when you add in, man, CJ Stroud is there. And that is a lot of fun to see CJ Stroud. I could play with. This guy who could be one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL 
in the next couple of years. This good guy could be a legendary, could be a Hall of Fame quarterback. We don't know what his future is. I could go yeah. play with this coach who's changed the culture in Houston that decided that this was the place he wanted to build that turned down other offers to come to Houston. I can go in with a, a general manager who's drafted really well recently, who has shown that he will make trades to make this a better team. I can come in and build around this. They've got a young defensive end in Will Anderson. They've got a lot of young talent around this team. They're built up. They they won a playoff game already. What can we do to build around it? And if you're from Texas, where Texas produces a ton of NFL talent, you come back and they want to have that part of their brand. They want to build on that as well. Yeah, it's just so weird that because I, I think, you know, now that we've talked about it, I don't think Texans have ever been in a position no. where they are a because is a sexy it franchise for, for free agents um, in the NFL, because even when Deshaun Watson was playing well and had a pristine image and everything and was con- considered a top five quarterback in the league, you still had. You know, like I said, Bill O'Brien was known as the what was he called him Teapot because he would always go off on yeah. players and fans. And then after that, you're right, it was the Jack Easterby years. Easterby was there around. Eh, Easterby was weird. All right. He was a strange dude. And they let him kind of infiltrate the organization. And the ownership was a bit of a clown show. Now you can see the ownership. Uh, you know, they've done a really good job, uh, you know, really kind of uh I would say just consolidating. Um, the ownership and now having a true kind of hierarchy of authority with the ownership with Nick Casario as the GM. Things are a lot more clearer now. Uh, McNair at the top as as the owner, but I think he sees control to football guys. So it's just interesting to see the the transformation. At one point, they couldn't get a coach that wanted to take the job, so they were considering, you know, like guys like Lovey Smith. They remember they're considering. Oh man, what was it? Um, I forgot the name of the quarterback. Josh McCown. Oh, Josh, Josh McCown. McCown. Well, that was a Jack Easterby guy. Yes. Remember, because they couldn't even get like a, a big time, respectable head coach to take the job because they yeah. were such a. So they were going to take a guy with zero coaching experience. Yes. Right. <laughs> and then you go from that to getting D'Amico Ryan's one of the hottest coaching candidates to say, no, no, I'll, I, when, if the Texans want me, I'll take that job and I won't even pursue my other options. I won't even take second interviews because this is this is my dream job. It's just weird that it happened in like two yeah. years. But I'll it, give the and at the time, credit. at the time, it was Houston was such a dumpster fire and and Denver was going to be the new hot team. Denver was coming in with the, the owners with all the money, and that was going to be the team that was going to build up. Mm-hmm. And if you look at that, when D'Amico Ryan's turned down Denver yeah, to go to to go to Houston, I, he looks like he made the right choice now. Great. I, you know what? He might have looked at him and like, this is, this is not as good as everybody thinks it is. This is fool's <laughs> gold out here in Denver. Yeah, these hills right. in Denver. It's a, no, it's a great, that's a good point, though, because he was. He was a hot name for that one. And I think there was another job, that another opening um, that considered him a top candidate as well. But he made the right choice, and the Texans are – they should be grateful for it. Uh, but there you go, some Texans talk. All right, let's get to Raj Rant quickly. And then we can get into our range report. We're going to cram all this in. Let's get to the Raj rant of the day. All right, so the Cowboys don't have a starting running back right now. They do have Rico Dowell on the roster. They do have Deuce Vaughn uh, still there who they drafted last year. They re-signed Rico Dowell in free agency. But you're still looking for that workhorse, uh, kind of main course, featured running back for the Cowboys. And they don't really have that guy. Rico Dowell and Deuce Vaughn could be complimentary pieces, so I'm not going to say they can't. But you still need the featured back. And where the Cowboys are going to find that featured back? Now, they could be looking for that featured back in free agency. I don't think it's a Zeke, but there are reports that the Cowboys um, and Zeke's camp have mutual interest in one another. Remember, Zeke signed a one-year deal with the Patriots last year for $3 million. He played like 51% of their offensive snaps, did lead them in rushing with 642, 642 yards, uh, but only averaged three and a half yards per carry. So that, that was the lowest number of his career. So at this point, I think we all know what Zeke is. He did have 51 receptions. But he's not, I don't think, in every down featured back. I think situationally, short yardage, goal line, uh, Zeke can be a real weapon. 
weapon for you. Uh, even pass, uh, if you're looking at pass protection, he's probably one of the best pass protection backs out there in the NFL too. But that's not, you know, the really the role of a featured back. Now, technically, you are still paying for Zeke. Um, because he has an he, uh, Ezekiel has an uh, over six million dollar dead cap charge on the Cowboys books for 2024, so maybe they could bring him back because it's like we're already paying for him. It happened to me with the Detroit Lions. The Detroit Lions overpaid me for like my first year there and brought me back for the second year. And I'm thinking more and more they might have brought me back because they already they had already paid me for it. I was on injured reserve, <laughs> but they paid me like I was on the roster. Only the Detroit Lions would make such a stupid mistake, but they paid me like I was on the roster, which I already had the money in my account. I wasn't gonna give it back. And then I was on the roster the second year, and then they started taking money out of my check like I was <clears throat> um, like. I was on IR and basically accounting explained to me like, oh yeah, we had overpaid you for that first year. We shouldn't have overpaid you. So, and I think that's honestly, they want to get their money back. So I think you brought your boy <laughs> back anyway. Uh, my point is the Cowboys could be doing something like that where, Hey, it just makes sense. You're going to bring in the running back. This is a guy you're already paying for. Why not bring him back? Uh, that could be the case. Um, but I think the Cowboys really need to try to find it featured back in the draft. And so I went and uh, I found this at Cowboys Wire. They did a really good job here. So shout out to them. Um, and they basically looked at the advanced analytical stat of RYOE, which is rushing yards over expected, um, which basically are guys who are outperforming the expectation, outperforming their contract, outperforming their status as a player with the team. And if you look at the top 10 players, top 10 running backs, I should say, who are uh, ranked in RYOE, uh, rushing yards over expected, the average draft position for those top 10 running backs is 155. 100 and 155, 155 and a half, actually. And if you go uh, look at the pro football focus top 10 running backs in average spot, they were drafted. You're looking at 108, uh, like 108.2. So you're looking at running backs on drafted on day three, basically. If you're looking now, this is top 10, you still can find you a starting running back potentially later on, but you want a running back that's going to give you more bang for your buck, right? And return on that investment. So of the top 10 running backs, uh, graded out in 2023. Only one, Christian McCaffrey, was drafted in the first round. Five were drafted on the second day. That's rounds two and three. And three were drafted in the fifth round. And one uh, went undrafted altogether. So if you give the undrafted player, just kind of give him a um, give him a draft position, or say just give him a draft slot. Um, say 265. If you do that. Um, with that in mind, the average draft spot of a top 10 running back comes in at like 108. So that's right at the top of the fourth round. And so you know, it, basically, if you drop past the fourth round looking for a starting running back, the likelihood of you finding one or a top notch starting running back, the likelihood of you finding one are going to drop precipitously. So if the Cowboys are looking for a featured back, it's going to be usually the fourth round. After the fourth round, it's going to be tough to find one. Uh, you know, an and, and elite one, what a high level one, a high level uh running back it looks just top 10 is what I'm, what I'm looking at here. So I think it's where the Cowboys are going to be. It's right around the fourth round is where they should be looking for a running back if they don't already have one. There you go, Cowboys fans. And you need one badly. I, and you could trade for one. We talked about that earlier, but the Cowboys need their, their draft picks uh for this draft and the future. Because we don't necessarily know what the Cowboys are going to do about the status of Dak. We don't know what they're going to do going forward. Right now, everybody's on a one-year deal. Uh, everybody seems like they're on a contract here with the Cowboys. So uh, that could be really interesting to see what they end up doing at running back. Teams are going to cut running backs, I'm sure, once they uh, trim down their rosters. Maybe the Cowboys are waiting on that so they can acquire a running back. Uh, but right now, the, uh, the choices are uh, slim. No. And I mean, you can always look at guys from the 2022, 2021 draft as well, that they'd be free agents coming up. So teams, if they're not thinking about paying them in the next year, uh, like a Khalil Herbert for, for the bears, who's a decent uh, yeah, running back. He's probably yeah. not an every down back, but he, you know, he does average over four and a half yards per carry he has every all first three years of his career. Uh, if you get a guy like him, his contract's coming up. He's only pay, getting paid a million dollars right now. It's a six round pick, but his contract's yeah. up after this year. So do you say, well, they're not going to re-sign him. They just signed DeAndre Swift. They drafted Roshan Johnson last year. They they may not need him as much, so maybe we can get a six-round pick and we can go get a clear Herbert, a fifth or sixth-round pick. We can go get him. 
and that gives us at least somebody in there that we feel can start for us week one versus drafting somebody in that round where we're hoping he's ready. But if we miss on that, we don't have a running back and we use the pick in the fourth round versus trading for somebody that we feel is going to be a little bit better of an option. Uh, but I'd look at somebody that was near the end because, again, if you're putting everybody in a contract year, then trade for someone in a contract year and keep the trend going. Mm-hmm. That's true. You know what? As, you might be on to something there. <clears throat> they want that, uh, excuse me, that sense of urgency with the roster right now. That seems to be the case. Uh, okay. You know what? Let's, ooh, what do you think? Rangers report now? Or should we push it? Let's hit the Rangers second. report now. We'll hit, a, we'll hit the Rangers report let's now. Do it. And, and then yeah, we'll get it. I want to talk some NBA on the other side too with you. All right. So let's do Rangers report right now. Let's talk some baseball uh, with our Rangers report. The Rangers report is brought to you by Texas Truck and Trailer. All right, time for our Rangers report. Rangers started out. Rangers are now two and one, uh, winning uh, their first series of the season over the Cubs. A uh, couple of little nuggets that I want to get to here about the Rangers, and it's something that I didn't realize until I heard them talking about it on, I think, the post game actually uh, for the Rangers after uh, their last win over the Cubs. The Rangers w- won the the World Series last season while finishing the regular season. 24th with the 24th ranked bullpen and they had the second worst bullpen ERA during the playoffs. Their bullpen was bad. Yeah. All well, well, it wasn't, it was below average, it wasn't bad. but it was actually bad in the playoffs. They had the worst bullpen ERA in the playoffs and they were 24th uh, in uh bullpen ERA uh, during the regular season. And that I, I said, that's mind blowing. There's no way to go, but up. From uh, with the Rangers bullpen, <laughs> and that's something to consider. And the Astros actually, their bullpen has you know started off a little shaky. Uh, and they were considered to have one of the top five best bullpens in all of Major League Baseball. Obviously, we got a long way to go, but that was shocking to hear them talk about that. And that is one of the real reasons for optimism. There are a lot of reasons for optimism with the Rangers um, because uh, everybody thought they were ahead of schedule, but that's one of the reasons they were ahead of schedule last year. You don't win the World Series when you're a below average to bad bullpen. That's what they were in 2023. That's why 2024 looks uh, looks to be a really, really pr- pretty much a coming out uh, party for the Rangers. Even though they're coming off a World Series win, they can end up being a much better bullpen, and they're going to be an upgraded roster too. Um, that's a scary thought for the for anybody else having to play the Rangers. Yeah, I mean, because if you can stay in games, if you can, you know, allow yourself an opportunity even when you're behind, which is what happened uh, in their opening day game. Was they were able to stay in the game and then get a walk off hit uh, in extra innings to end that one, but to not give up that lead, to be able to get into extra innings, to stay, uh, you know, in the game. That's a big piece of what the Rangers missed early on and, and definitely missed at some points in the season. Why the Astros could still win the division last year was that problem. Their hitting was able to carry them through the playoffs. But yeah, they shore up that bullpen. And then, especially, you were talking about later in the season, uh, getting Scherzer and DeGrom back into the lineup. Uh, getting some starting pitching back. If you put all those pieces together, uh, there's a lot of room for optimism, a lot of reasons for optimism for this Rangers team. Yeah, uh, Rangers um, with a 11-2 win over uh, the Cubs, uh, and they lost that that last game, obviously, 9-5 to to the Cubs. They're going to start off, and we'll have it right here because we are your uh, official station for the Texas Rangers. Uh, We're going to have that Tampa – Tampa Bay Rays matchup on today. Uh, they're going to face off with them. That'll start. I'll be five fifty. Five fifteen. A pregame will be, and then pre-game. so you okay. can hear that right there. And then yeah, the game will be at five forty-five, five fifty in that range. Uh, there you go. Uh, something else to keep in mind with this Ranger squad because um, scoring shouldn't be an issue. And we talked about if anything is going to be an issue for them, maybe the bullpen. Um, but if they can fix that, they could end up being just a a true force uh, during the regular season. The Rangers, uh, they scored five plus runs in 61% of day games last season. Not, not random little factoid. They scored five plus comes from Jared Sandler, who does a uh, great job uh, covering the, the, the Rangers. He said the Rangers scored five plus runs. He's their play by play guy in 61% of day games last season, the highest rate in Major League Baseball. If you look at day games at home specifically, the Rangers scored five plus runs in 80%, actually close to 81% of their day games at home 
also highest rate in Major League Baseball. So if you go if, if you go see the Rangers at home during the day, uh, you they're gonna put on a show for you. There's a good chance they're gonna put on a show for you and score a lot of runs. Uh, that though that was a cool stat. And there's a little factoid for you that's also really cool. We talked about Ryan Langford a lot last uh, show. I saw last Rangers report um, and him making uh, the roster and having I think the third fewest games played before making an opening day roster. He also now has the <clears throat> prestigious honor uh, to be the, how about this? Jared, uh, Jared Sandler had this, so I'll give him props for it. Cause he's the one that had it. Uh, Why Langford ended up being uh, having the first player with an intentional uh, walk in his major league baseball debut since Daniel Johnson. <laughs> That's he a was, good he got a, He's the first player with an intentional walk in his Major League Baseball debut since 2020, Daniel Johnson, second in Rangers slash Senators history, joining 1965 Jim French. That's crazy. So he's getting already getting respect to get basically a walk already. And how about this one? Of the 44, Langford is the 44th player in Major League Baseball history to receive an intentional walk in his Major League Baseball debut. Um. So 44th overall, but first player since 2020 to do it. And of the 44 players in Major League Baseball history to receive an intentional walk in their Major League Baseball debut, 13 were number eight hitters uh, in the NL batting in front of a pitcher, which is <laughs> which is kind of strange. Uh, but that little factor, I probably should add that in what the facts. But yeah, Langford uh, get an intentional walk, which is like I said, ultimate respect that I guess they've done that, their scouting. And, and I mean, and there's points in that you're doing it because, you know, you want to set up a double play. You want to be able to get a guy on first, but it's still, there's a lot of times where if you're going up against a guy that you feel uh, has no issue that you could get him a strikeout or you could get him to, you know, not get basically bad into whatever you want him to do. If you feel you could do that, then you, you don't have to intentionally walk him. That's not the case. We saw Wyatt Langford got a hit in every game. He looks like he's uh, not missing a beat right now. So I, I get it. There is definitely some level of respect in that intentional walk to Langford. Um, his first career extra base hit was a game tying triple hit uh, just to left of straightaway center. So, yeah, he's he's a stud. <laughs> he's a real deal. So there are some reasons why Rangers fans should be really, really excited about their team. Uh, won this, the World Series last year, despite having one of the worst bullpens in Major League Baseball. Uh, and Wired Langford looks like he's going to be as good as advertised. Uh, no doubt about that. All right. Uh, that is our Rangers report on a Monday. Bye, Texas. The Rangers Report is brought to you by Texas Truck and Trailer, your premier truck accessory dealer. All right, we come back. I want to talk some NBA. Is Luca making his MVP case a little bit stronger? We'll discuss that <clears throat> and also uh, get into some of the other uh, headlines around the NBA. Uh, my prediction about Wimby winning defensive player of the year, I think that case is getting a little bit stronger. Uh, and also we'll talk about uh, some of the other trends or trending teams in the NBA on the court. All that and more right here on the broadcast. When we return featuring Patrick Davis, I'm Lifetime Lohan Rod Davis coming back on the horn.
Welcome back to the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis, uh, the Idillionaire. He comes up with the musically themed days of the week, and it is a smooth soul Monday to get you, uh, you know, just get you worked back into the uh, the work week with a smooth transition. He wants to get you a smooth transition into the work week, uh, as stress free as possible, and a smooth soul Monday uh, helps him do that. So we we'll appreciate all of uh, Patrick's efforts and all of his creativity. Uh, I hate April Fool's Day uh, with a passion. <laughs> I hate it. It's I can't you can't believe a damn thing on your timeline. I, it's just so much, so many random stories, and I can't. I gotta ignore all of them. I gotta ignore all of them, even the ones that are real. I gotta ignore them. This is this is real, this is why me and Rod were well together. Neither one of us. There was not a text, not a not a, even a thought of either one of us doing a prank. We are both just like no, that's not. I don't want to do. I don't do that. No. I don't need to be a prankster on on April mm. Fool's Day. Come on, I don't need. Come to. on, guys. Especially in our in our industry. Come on. I, why am I trying to get a fake story out there? That's all it is. Fake stories everywhere on my timeline. Uh, so uh, and now people are trying to actually fool you. So they're trying to make fake stories look really real. They're yeah. not even trying to do it from an April Fool's perspective anymore. They're actually trying to make. They're trying to fool people. So now I can't believe anything on my damn timeline. Now, and then they got AI stuff. now, so you can make an image oh, that looks man. like the image, and you think, oh, well. That's exactly right. Oh, yeah, man. Terrible. It is. I, I've always hated April Fool's, but these days, I got to tell you, I hate, I, with this job, I hate it even more. Because I think with some jobs, you can just ignore April Fool's yeah. and never come in contact with somebody who's an April Fool joker. Uh, but now, I think with the timeline, it, it, it's half my timeline are April Fool's jokes. Good ones and bad ones, terrible ones. Some are actually pretty good. Like I actually entertained a couple and went, huh? Oh, that'd be a cool story to me. Oh damn it! Oh, it's April, it's April Fool's. Yeah, I can't. That's not a cool story. Yeah. See, so this, go. this is gonna be the problem now. Is something's gonna be retweeted in like three days? Yes, and it'll get you. <laughs> and I'll think, oh, we're past April Fools, and I won't realize that the story was from three days ago, and yes. then I'll think it's real. I think that'll get me too, brother. And I honestly, I hate it with a passion. I really, really do. All right. Uh, something I know my man Patrick loves with a passion is NBA, NBA basketball. And I, I keep seeing this everywhere. People talking about the Mavs being one of the biggest threats in the West, a threat to the Denver Nuggets, a, a threat to, I think, OKC is obviously one of the uh, the leaders there in the West, the leader. I think they're leading the, the West right now. But that the Mavs are trending and they have star power with Luka um, that can be really dangerous in the playoffs. Uh, Luka showed it once again. He had a a great performance. I believe his mom was in town too. I just saw that. I saw that. And that wasn't April Fool's show. That was from yesterday. Uh, that his mom was in town at that game. They played against the Rockets and ended the Rockets 11 game win streak. And Luca just showed out, put on a show. And there are a lot of the MVP rankings. And I'm not talking about the odds. That's different from Vegas. I'm about the rankings. And ESPN does their own rankings. Uh, NBA Central does their rankings. That Luca has now moved into second. Uh, behind Nikola Jokic uh, as the uh, the MVP favorite behind Nikola Jokic after his 30, I believe uh, that performance, he had 32 points by halftime <laughs> of that game versus the Rockets. Uh, they put an old Testament style butt whipping on what was the hottest team in the NBA at the time, arguably the, what had been the best team in the month of March, the Houston Rockets, and Luka had 47, 12, and 7 against them. Is Luca getting um, more and more support, or maybe more and more momentum that he actually could win the MVP, or is this just say a pipe dream for Luca? No, I mean he's definitely getting a lot of more support, and I think you know his his candidacy really comes down to the fact of do they want to give it to Jokic for a third time, for a third time in four years? Uh, that that kind of what it feels like is Jokic is your front runner to be the yeah. the MVP right now. He's got the the Nuggets. They're a half game behind first place in the West. If you're saying you're giving it to the best player on the best team, uh, I mean, technically, the, the Celtics have the best record. They have an 11-game lead in the Eastern Conference. The Eastern mm -hmm. Conference isn't as good as the Western Conference. It, there would look like a point where it was going to be. It's not. Uh, so the Western Conference is still really, really tough. And Jokic is that guy. And you watch him play, and you can see just how good he is, and he can do it without making it look difficult. But I think Luca, on the on the flip of that, is putting up ridiculous numbers. He had that streak ridiculous. of thirty point triple doubles that would happen. He set the record for that. The triple double streak he had going. He is putting up a ton, 
Uh, there's people that will say that he takes off too many plays on the defensive end. There will say there's plays. People will say there there's other factors of his game where he's not necessarily putting out the effort. I know I've talked to Mavs fans who have said that they complain that basically he could average 15 rebounds a game, but he just doesn't try for them until he wants to triple double. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes after him. He's just that good of a player. Uh, but in seeing all that, he could still go out there. And if they don't want to give it to, to Jokic for a third time in four years, they said, pass on. The question is, do you give it to an SGA who has the second, who right now is a, the leading team in the West? Do you give it to a Jason Tatum who has the best record in the NBA? Is it more of a best player on the best team award? Or do you go down and say, if the Mavs can get into that four seed, if they can talk, top the Clippers, does that give you enough to say, well, look on this team. If you take Luke off this, and I get Kyrie Irving is a heck of a player. I don't want to take anything away from Kyrie Irving. But the rest yeah. of this roster, this other starters, Derek Jones Jr., P.J. Washington, <laughs> Daniel Gafford, Derek Lively, Josh Green, Maxi Kleba. Like, that's who else is on this team. So I think yeah. if you say, look at who else is on this team, that this is not necessarily a great lineup of guys around him, and they're gonna they have the possibility to pass a team with Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Russell Westbrook, and James Harden. Then maybe you look at that and say, yeah, it, we get that those other guys, but those other teams are built a little bit better. They have more talent on them. Clearly, the the Thunder and clearly the the Celtics have more talent than the Mavs do across the board. So does Luca get the MVP in that sense? And you could definitely say that. I think where Jokic gets another hand is that, you know, other than Jamal Murray, then Aaron Gordon, and then you lost Bruce Brown. Michael Porter Jr. is not super consistent. So that team as well falls into the category of maybe not the most stacked, uh, talented team. Yeah, right now the Mavs have a league-high seven-game win streak. If they can win out, now that's a – that's, that's a bold statement uh, in the NBA to win out, but they can win out um, the rest of their games. I believe they got one, two, three, four. They got eight games left. Will he win the MVP? They went out. I mean, if they went out, if they have game a, win streak. If they have a 15 game win streak. They most likely move into the four spot. Uh, they're playing really well. It could very easily. He could be in that Tip position. The scales. Tip the yeah. scales. Uh, I mean, it's going to matter what SGA does at the end of the season. It matters what, uh, uh, what Tatum does at the end of the season. I, I'm personally not a guy to put Tatum on that level just because I don't, I think that he doesn't even want to be the best player on his team or he says he does, but he disappears in big moments. So I don't, time, yeah. I just don't necessarily give it to him. Uh, I SGA, I think is very close. He, there's definitely an argument. If you want to talk two ways, if you want to talk doing everything. Uh, there's definitely an argument for him as well. Uh, I'd personally problem have, have him above Luca, but what the, Odds makers would tell you what history would tell you is that Luca will be the second behind Jokic. And if they don't want to give it and they're looking for someone else and he has a 15 game win streak and he puts up a couple more 40, 50 point games and, and a couple more triple doubles, those stats become easier and easier to go ahead and put him at MVP. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it, it is really, I think this season actually might be the season for him to do it because it does seem to be split, uh, but you're right. They got to make a run in order for him to, to lock it up or to even tip the scales in his favor. All right. A uh, little NBA discussion there. We'll come back get ready to wrap this thing up and put it in the oven. Before we do that, we'll play who said that right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm lifetime long run Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
All right, welcome back to the broadcast. Uh, time for who said that? Uh, shout out to my man Patrick doing a great job though with the smooth so Monday edition of the broadcast. Also, the big fat poll today is up there, so go check that out. Uh, you can go check that out at uh, the Horn Twitter account. Also, uh, go check it out on the text line five one two four four seven three seven seven six. All right, before we get out of here, we got to play who said that. We play a bit of audio, uh, and you can play at home while you're listening, or you play in your car while you're listening, and based on the audio that we play uh you try to figure out what sports personality or what celebrity uh who it is that we're actually featuring in who said that mike d'antonio was there with me and all the great players he's coaching seeing he tap my leg i would echo that statement that um he's the best one-on-one player i've ever seen or coach or been around um and it's not a one-off, it's not a one game, every other game is every night thing, it's uh, every practice thing does something that wows you, and so, um, you know, I was at USA Basketball, myself, Jason Tatum, Ken, uh, Kevin Grant, where they were all, we were all talking about the best one-on-one players, and they've all played with Kyrie, and I think without hesitation, everybody said it was Kyrie, and so, like I said, I saw it on a day-to-day basis, and so, Still makes you shake your head. Some of the things he does. So the, the left-handed runner to win the game a few games ago for something that he works on has that touch, has that confidence, and it's not a lucky shot by any means. And so, um, yeah, I echo that statement. I think a lot of guys in the league coaching wise as well. Um, you know, funny story. Mike D'Antoni was there with me, and all the great players he's coaching, seeing he would tap my leg once a game, and some Kyrie did offensively. And so it's not a surprise to anybody. I think he's by far the best offensive player I've ever seen. So Emil Doka saying he's the best man man to man offensive player he's ever seen. And KD says he's the best skill, he's the most skilled player he's ever seen. It, it, it seems like they they, res, they seem like the players respect Kyrie's game more than fans do. Is that is that correct or accurate? Patrick? Yeah, yeah. I mean 100 percent I think every player wants to play with Kyrie Irving. That's why he, players will vouch for him always. There's certain players that maybe don't like like James Harden didn't necessarily like playing with him, but a lot of people don't like playing with James Harden. So that <laughs> that could be the the you know, it could be something yeah. uh pot calling the kettle black or something of that of of but yeah, yeah, players love Kyrie Irving because he is one of the most skilled players to ever play the game. Yeah, he's getting more and more love, and he's matched up with one of the other most skilled players to ever play the game in Luka uh, Doncic. Thank you for everything you do, Patrick. You are the man, the real MVP. Thank you guys out there for listening. We appreciate all your participation. Remember, the revolution not be televised. We're talking about it right here on the broadcast. Everybody have a great night. Enjoy it. Uh, be kind to one another. We love you. We mean that. Until next time, peace.